the, the issue I would like to uh, present to you is one of the current uh, basis that I'm in process. The issue I'm going to present to you is one of the most complex aspects of the theory of anticipatory systems. Uh, the, quest, the title of my uh, presentation is Where the Models Came From. So first I have to give you an idea of where this question came from and uh, in order to understand uh, why it is framed this way. Let me very shortly repeat uh, some of the basic uh, Aspects of, aspects of the theory of anticipatory uh, system. We have already uh, seen uh, that anticipation came in different guises, in different ways. Uh, as a technical term, anticipation presents uh, two different components. A model-based uh, foresight or forecast according to the, the type and the use of the outcomes of that model for uh, for decisions. Uh, when I'm saying model-based, I'm using the concept of model in a very extensive way. So I'm including not only purely scientific models, uh, but also psychological attitudes, for instance, like fears, hopes, expectations, because all of them frame the ways in which we look at the future. So model, in my understanding, is a very generic term and not only uh, not, not only something something else. Uh, models can be internal to the system or can be external to the system that is making the anticipation. Which is the difference? Uh, we can use information from external sources, watching weather forecasts. These are external models, and we use eventually the outcomes in order to modify our uh, behaviors. But fears and hopes uh, are internal models. They have to do with contents uh, that are generated within our cognitive systems, our cognitive capacities. So the problem uh, is these internal models or these internal contents, if you prefer, where do they come from? Because if or when we have to do with external models, that's not an issue, obviously. Somebody else is, or something else, is generating that model, we simply access to it and use in the ways that we uh, consider the best. But where models are internally generated to the anticipatory system, the question of their origin is mandatory. And here there are two major schools that defend very different ideas. I call them the representational way of understanding the origin of models and the presentational one. Uh, linguistically speaking, the difference is very uh, is small, but uh, uh, from a content-based <coughs> point of view, they are uh, very similar. Represent the representational attitude, the representational stance, uh, says that even internal model came, came from another source. For instance, well, maybe another source, either spatially, or temporally. It's something that has to do with our previous history, for instance. All uh, evolutionary explanations adopt uh, a kind of uh, temporally displayed so, uh, generation of internal numbers. The problem is uh, that with both the special, the special orientation and the temporal orientation, the problem is that in both cases, an infinite regress begins. Because if models came from something else, and then that model came from something else again, or from a temporal point of view, it has to do with our previous history, okay, so far so good. But then, 
that's the where it comes from. At some point, there must be a first step. Otherwise, there is an infinite regress behind all these issues. And the problem is that the representational point of view does not have uh, an answer to this initial question. So it is a position that is self-contradictory. The only problem is that most of contemporary science defend the representational point of view. Most of cognitive science, most of computer science, most of artificial intelligence and so on and so forth, they all defend a representational point of view. It means uh, these uh, otherwise uh, very relevant scientific endeavors uh, are self-contradictory. They, they do not stand. They are not able to defend their own position. So something else is needed. Before uh, giving at least a, a small hint about uh, uh, which other alternative can be adopted in order to keep the, 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 the entire process working, please note here I, I will say something, I will not have the time to, uh, to, to articulate or to defend. But the difference I'm going, I, I, I am presenting between the representationalist and the presentationalist understanding of the generation of model, of model mirrors a number of basic conceptual differences in our uh, science. It mirrors the difference between syntax and semantics. Representationalist uh, models defend a syntax first orientation. The others defend a syntax semantic first orientation. Another uh, conceptual opposition that is behind this reasoning is the difference between structure and function. Again, a representationalist defines a stru structure-based vision while the other defines a function-based vision. Or the difference between element and subsystem from the point of view of the theory of system. So, what I'm presenting uh, mirrors a number of conceptual issues that are central to our scientific vision of the world. And if one of these conceptual uh, opposition changes, there will be rever uh, reverberations on uh, all the others. So what else can be done? Uh, the, the opposite uh, uh, framework uh, defends the idea that uh, contents or meanings, or what they call models, they automatically, naturally grow and develop within the working condition of the system, from the very beginning. Let me frame a little bit from a psychological point of view the difference. The basic idea is that within the species present, that is, that interface between the external world and the ways in which our mind works. I mean, the minimum temporal span of our, which lasts usually between 200 milliseconds and 3000 milliseconds. So that's, I mean, what happens here and now. Here and now, that kind of step up. Contents are automatically generated from the structure of the species present. The simplest exemplification you can try is simply just close your eyes and then open them. And as soon as you open your eyes, you see a meaningful scene around you. It's not a bit of meaningless pieces that are elaborated in a computer-based way. The scene that appears in a fraction of a second is already structured, is already organized. The, all the machinery that is behind is a machinery that uh, works from the very beginning in a meaningful way. Or 
to use one of the oppositions I was referring before, which was natively, uh, from the very beginning, in a semantic way. Everything is conducted from the point of view of a meaningful thing. All the syntax that is needed is simply, well, everything that is available is used by the system. So it's the, the other way around respect to uh, the usual way in which these things are presented. There are two major uh, traditions, well, tradition is too strong, two major uh, theories or positions, uh, and probably many others too that I know, uh, defending the presentationalist point of view which is uh, the uh, activity and the theory developed by Mark uh, Bickard, which is called interactivism, which is one, ways of, one way of presenting this uh, train of uh, thinking, and Lilian Albertazzi, experimental phenomenology, which, is a, which starts from a phenomenological attitude, which has obviously to do with a, a meaningful scene, but proved through experiments, proved through uh, psychological experiments showing how things work. So I'm not saying, just to, to uh, repeat and close uh, this part, uh, that uh, there aren't representations, obviously, most of what we do in our reasoning, in our, I mean, decision processes and so on and so forth, has to do with representations in the usual way. What I'm saying is that at least some contents, and especially those that are born within the species presence, that very thin temporal window between, I mean, the here and now, what happens exactly in this moment in our coin abilities have a different nature. And all the rest is a development arising from this first step. I'm sorry if I've been a bit technical on these issues. I know that I've touched upon a number of not easy questions and problems. But that's one of the important aspects of an anticipatory point of view. Because the opposition is whether anticipations are only free creations of our mind, individually or socially, doesn't matter, or whether some anticipation, some anticipation are wired within the ways in which we work. Understanding that difference may be uh, something relevant from an evolutionary point. very pleased to hear that this is a meaningful scene. Um, hi, uh, so are there any questions, um, just for clarification? Oh, great, okay, so you are... Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Hayley, I'm from the University of Roehampton where I'm doing my PhD and I'm interested in what motivates us to listen to the same pieces of music multiple times. Um, so I'll just talk about a portion of my research. So as Joni Mitchell so beautifully puts, songs are like tattoos, they stay with us for life, they're deeply ingrained. Um, one of my favourite pieces of music is the song called Blue by Joni Mitchell. Um, for me, it has these magic, aesthetically beautiful moments that I anticipate. And I savour that anticipation every time I listen to it. And it's not because of the memories that might be associated with it, it's the way that the notes are positioned and patterned in a particular melodic and rhythmic way. And it's very likely that every person in this room has the same experience with pieces of music that they love. Um, so this is something that spurs my research. Why is it that we can be emotionally engaged by pieces of music, even though we know exactly what's coming next and we've heard them dozens of times or even hundreds of times? 
And this is because of our biological predisposition to predict the future based on the past. So as David Huron puts it, he's um, a professor, American professor in music and psychology. Um, expectation pervades the human condition. A cook expects a broth to taste a certain way. A pedestrian expects the traffic to move when the light turns green. A poker player expects an opponent to bluff. And the same is true for music, whether we're listening to Bach, Black Sabbath, or Joni Mitchell. Uh, music takes us on a narrative of predictability and surprise that draws us in again and again. And so expectancy, music expectancy has um, received decades of research since the 50s. Um, a chap called Leonard Mayer published a book called Emotion and Meaning in Music in 1956. And he, uh, this is probably the most cited work in music expectancy research. And he proposed that when we listen to music, our mind non-consciously generates predictions about the future based on past trends and tendencies. And it's the disruption of uh, our expectations, or you could say irregularities in the music, that give rise to emotional effect and aesthetic. Um, but then, since then, this brings us to a paradox because often, more often than not, we know what's coming next. We choose to listen to pieces of music because we've heard them before. So, um, anyway, that's just, these are just some of the key studies that aim to model musical understanding, uh, which all have expectation at the root of, of their theories. So, um, so how is it that we can still be surprised by elements of music that we're familiar with? We think it's because um, that expectations stem from three sources within music, uh, from within music's past and present. So first, the first source are current musical structures. So whatever we're listening to, whatever's in train at that very moment, um, and these can be patterns that occur within groups of notes. So this is related to just out based uh, grouping principles. So we would perhaps expect a rising scale to continue rising. Also within current structures, we might, um, our expectations will be affected by patterns that occur between groups of notes. So you might be listening to a piece, hear a riff once or twice and expect to hear that again. Um, and these are referred to as dynamic expectations. So they're ever evolving, flexible expectations that are sort of going on in our working memory. The second two forms of expectation stem from previously heard musical structures. Uh, and these are known as schematic expectations and veridical. So schematic expectations are schema-driven. They're learned from a lifetime of exposure to music. They're weighted by probability. They're based on trends and tendencies in the music. Um, and they're sort of automatically generated. And they give us a general indication about what might come next. And then veridical expectations offer a specific idea about what might come next. These are specific expectations. So this is how we are able to have a sense of familiarity with something that we've heard before. So um, just to recap, some of you might know this already, but it might be to a lot of you. Um, so veridical expectations give us a specific idea of what's coming next. Schematic expectations offer a general sense of what's coming next. And then dynamic expectations anchor both of those within the local musical context that's currently in train. So I aim to... Um, so these, there's an interplay between these expectations that changes every time we listen to a, a piece of music. So it changes with familiarity. <coughs> Uh, which has an effect on our aesthetic experiences with music and um, 
I aim to try and measure this relationship, how it changes in response to repetition, and to try and try, attempt to, to quantify that and model that. So I've um, done some experiments with various participant groups, that, that, which includes children aged 6 to 16, um, children with autism, and adults who are musicians and not musicians. Um, but I'm still um, analysing my data, so I've only got information at the moment about my adult participant group. So I'll just talk a bit about what, um, what they did. So 43 adults took part in two sessions. Uh, they were separated by seven days. And in each session they heard the same 26 note melody, uh, piano melody, um, four times, so they heard it eight times altogether. The melody is made up, I don't have a recording on it, unfortunately, but it's made up of repeating phrases, so it's like phrase A, phrase A, phrase B1, and then phrase A, phrase A, phrase B2. So it's got transposed repetition. Um, so whilst participants were listening to each melody, they were providing note-by-note -note expectancy ratings using a touch-sensitive MIDI um, controller on the desk in front of them, which ranged from uh, very unexpected on the left to very expected on the right. So they just tap their finger and it sends MIDI information to a connected laptop. And they did this for all eight melodies. And then these are some of my results. So, um, just to talk, walk you through, the left hand side is the expectedness. So it ranges from naught, very unexpected, to 120, very expected. You've got the pitch, each note along the bottom, along the bottom. <coughs> and then you've got exposures one, two, three, and four. So you can see, um, that in the pattern of expectation is almost identical for each melody exposure, so they're hearing it in the same way. Um, so this, to me, represents their schematic expectations, which are automatically driven, and they always hear it in the same way. But then, at the same time, the overall expectedness increases with each hearing. So these are the veridical expectations. So you can see there's a tug of war between the non-conscious, um, schema-driven, probability-weighted um, expectations, and then the conscious familiarity with the uh, growing familiarity with each repetition. Um, and the same goes for session two, as expected. Um, but then, but then, uh, when you put them together after a week's break. Um, there's a sort of drop in the sense of in the veridical expectations, but then the familiarity increases much more quickly in the second week. Um, there's still a lot more to, to be done and to be said about this, but um, it indicates, it gives some indication about how it is that we are repeatedly engaged by pieces of music, even when we know what's happening, what's going next, because on one, on one hand, our non-conscious is always surprised by irregularity, but our conscious is able to anticipate that moment of surprise, and that's what gives us this sense of tension and emotional pleasure that we get. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, and also, it's knowing what's coming next can intensify that sense of pleasure. Um, so it's interesting because without really consciously knowing that we're doing it, each time we listen to music, we're manipulating that predictive making mechanism um, in order to generate some emotional pleasure or self-enhancement or mood regulation or whatever reason it is that we're listening to a piece of music. Um, and I think because music's a self, like a self-contained a hotbed of regularity and pattern that it's a unique way that we can through that we can use oh, just 
that as well. A unique window through which we can look at these anticipatory processes, um, especially in the realm of aesthetics and pleasure, uh, emotional pleasure. But um, also at the same time, I think it would be interesting to take this beyond music. Um, so the findings accord with widely, widely recognised um, psych psychological research on dual processing, so uh, where our behaviour is, is um, affected by a system one, which is this rapid automatic system, and then system two, which is a slow conscious deliberate system. I've also, I only bought the book last week, but um, Looking at people's abstracts for this session, I came across the predictive mind and I thought that really, um, I, I'm interested to see if there are some links that I can find there, because it's also very similar to the, the bottom one, which is the information dynamics of music, which is a statistical model of music and understanding, which essentially um, posits that musical understanding is, is, is we, we, it's statistical learning, it's based on statistical learning. So, um, so yeah, I'm interested to look into this a bit more deeply and try and make some connections there. So, uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Good evening, thank you very much. Um, also, thanks um, for the two previous talks. And I'm I'm very happy that I think they go they go all together actually. So I'm, I will speak briefly about critique of mind, and I will speak also about these internal models. Um, and our assumption here is that these internal models are useful on the one hand because they allow us to sort of know what's going to happen in environment and so on. But on the other hand, they are not very useful because they take us to, they take away the chance to anticipate new and unexpected. Potentials. And this is where we say we need sort of unlearning, whatever that means, I'll come to that in a second, but we need some unlearning processes or triggers in order to trick our internal models and anticipate um, unexpected things. Um, just to give you a brief context of the research, um, Professor Peschel is at the University of Vienna, he's a cognitive scientist and philosopher of science. And I also did cognitive science, but I'm uh, doing a PhD in organization learning and knowledge management. So we try to bridge these two fields and see how anticipation, unlearning, and so on helps in the context of innovation. So just to give you an idea where we come from. So we take the um, notion of anticipation, I think, to the most extreme. We say that if we truly want to innovate, if we want to create new knowledge, we sort of have to understand that anticipation is about understanding the affordance structure or architecture um, of the future. So, somehow the environment yields structures that, embodies, or that, that embody opportunities for us to act and for us to create environment. And the question is, how can we identify these opportunities? And, in theory, it's pretty simple, I guess. In theory, we can say anticipation is about perceiving future potentials in the present to create new futures. But in practice, it's not that easy, I, I, I'm afraid. And I think you, 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 you all, all already mentioned that very well. Um, we are used to stick to our past experiences. Or you said, um, knowing what's next it, it intensifies the pleasure or something. So I really like that sentence. And I think this is the problem we're dealing with here. And this whole being um, influenced by our past and being, you know, projecting the past into the future or extrapolating the, the past into the future is um, well illustrated by a very current um, or a contemporary theory in economic science and cognitive neurosciences, which is called the predictive mind theory. And I will use this, this theory to emphasize the problem we're dealing with in terms of anticipation and also to, delete, to differentiate anticipation from prediction because in that, under that um, perspective, this becomes a bit um, confusing. So, if, I, if, if, if you were a neuroscientist 30 years ago, okay, and I would ask you, okay, please explain to me what happens when someone enters the room, what happens in the brain. You would say, 
Yeah, I think it's pretty easy, right? So you enter the room and the brain tries to re-mirror the room um, internally. So this is the, the whole representational um, point of view. We have representations of environmental features and this sort of correspond to what's happening out there. Okay? If you ask a neuroscientist today, not all of course, this is what you, what you mentioned already, but if you ask proponents of this predictive mind theory, they would say, okay, before you enter a room, you have a number of expectations and predictions about what is going to happen in the room. So the brain already sort of expects what the room looks like, what the room entails, and so on. And what happens is that the brain projects hypotheses about what is going to happen and sort of checks if, this, if these hypotheses are true. What, and this, the problem here is that we are close to active patient inference, okay? So the brain all, only uses these expectations for these hypotheses that were already sort of um, confirmed or that already occurred. <coughs> the interesting thing is um, that this predictive mind theory works with two pathways, with two neural pathways, um, namely top-down, bottom-up pathway, and I may make this, this um, error a bit bolder because the top-down um, projections are way more important than the bottom-up projections. So the brain is more concerned with, I hope, to confirm what I know or expect um, instead of I try to um, actualize or to, to sort of refresh my expectations of my models. So, in terms of anticipation, we would say these bottom-up projections are very important because everything that we do not expect, everything that we would find surprising might point to potentials that we do not already see. Okay, but the problem is, and this is this dark room argument or this dark room paradox, we sort of stick to the projections or to the predictions we have in place. So that the brain is not, as I said, in the business of constantly refreshing itself, but it's more like, okay, I hope. So that the brain is not, as I said, in the business of constantly refreshing itself, but it's more like, okay, I hope. So that the brain is not. As I said, in the business of constantly refreshing itself, but it's more like, okay, I hope, it's more like, okay, I hope, it's more like, okay, I hope, business of constant, I hope, business of constant, I hope, business of constant, I hope, business of. Business of constant. I hope business of. I hope business of constant. I hope business of. I hope business of constant. I hope business of.
I hope you will have a little break and uh, your brains are not too full because we have yet another very interesting dancing session. We have three presentations uh, and they are going to follow each other as we've done earlier. No more than 20 minutes and not yet We'll take any clarification questions that you might want to pose or any super important things before we take the next seat. Just so you're all happy. There is an audience. I am with you. I mean, of course, I have another role. But the audience, they aren't here at the moment, the audience has a responsibility to listen and to think about questions that matter to them, not only the speakers. They have a responsibility to share them, to make them problematic, and to challenge each other at this time of day, to reflect on what's gone on during the day, to shake each other up if they've been complacent and making assumptions about things that are incorrect. So if that's not warmed you all up, there's no popcorn. We do have a short film to start. And it's filling in as I know this is what's going to happen. So if you're forgive me for this. Uh, I think it's fascinating to see such an eclectic crowd of people. And as I did at the last session I chaired earlier today, people like this. So can we very quickly just say what kind of backgrounds we come from? And just very, very quickly, just so we have some sense for our poor presenters as to who they might be watching by and heard by. Yeah? I have future studies broadly. Okay. Design fiction. Industrial design and strategy. Service design. Philosophy and design. Social features, uh, specifically creative features. I will not say it later. Defense and science and technology. In design and techno science. Great. Because I have studies within media. For the minute. Design, thinking, and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I've got the word neuroscience. I've been waiting for all day to get the Good. Okay. Um, how about you? And music psychology, you must be hundreds more such people across <laughs> over interest, but maybe not professional. Okay. So one of the things, do we need a few more chairs? Uh, we can share this one here. Another one if you'd like to sit on the side here. Make sure comfortable. One there. Okay. So welcome everyone. We have our first uh, presenters in our session today uh, that are going to, in a sense, bring us to the everyday. And the design of the everyday, the engagement of the everyday, our everyday aspirations, where do we place ourselves when we think of the everyday? What is your everyday? How many days do you have every day? What kind of time of the nocturnal do you live? What kind of passage of time do we need to think about as we hear and receive these presentations now? So right, we're ready to start. We've got maximum 20 minutes. Thank you. Off we go. Okay, um, I hope you will bear up to those expectations. Uh, maybe not, maybe some other things will come out. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, our presentation today. So we are Nicola. Uh, Nic uh, Nicola is an anthropologist and sociologist by training, working in the Lancaster University Institute for Social Futures. And I'm Monica. I'm a design researcher by training and uh, with an affinity for social theory. And I work in the design department of the TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Uh, in this talk, we'll present our reflections on a workshop we organized this summer titled Making Everyday Futures. And uh, in the workshop, we explored the potential of designing as a way to research future everyday life, so designing to know. Um, it's clear that in the future, ways of life, practices, capabilities, and forms of well-being will be different from today across society. But how might aspects of everyday life that are plausible, possible, and preferable be imagined, materialized, and studied? This question formed the starting point for uh, our, workshop, our workshop on making. Um, as you can read in our abstract, which you have of course all done, uh, or you might do later <laughs> if you get interested from this, uh, design research has developed methods to design and prototype everyday objects that pose questions. 
rather than present solutions, uh, by materializing alternative realities. Uh, with the workshop, we explored whether and how research objects or research artifacts that engage, that engage with future of day life can offer new perspectives in the present. Um, the three-day workshop had 26 participants from a range of disciplinary backgrounds uh, recruited for their interest in uh, future everyday life. Um, and they uh, approached future everyday life from a variety of starting points such as climate change, public health and uh, network lives. And during the workshop, the participants worked in pairs uh, to design and make a research artifact that re represented a what-if question um, related to their personal, to their research interests, so to their research interests into the future every day. Um, so now I change this a I feel a complicated computer setting going on here, as you can see. Um, so uh, day one of the workshop focused on getting to know each other, um, getting to know the making facilities that were available to the participants in the industrial design department of the TU Eindhoven, uh, the materials that we had prepared for them, along with uh, technical expertise to help them make stuff, um, and also the theory behind researching the future every day for making. Um, day two centered on discussing, discussing and materializing the eight questions, and on day three, uh, the 13 research artifacts were presented in an exhibition. Um, so those were the 13 research artifacts. And we had them photographed together with their later slide of my photographer. Uh, in this talk, we present a selection of insights from our analysis of the different ways in which the future and the everyday are conceptualized in these 13 research artifacts. Uh, and we will do so by uh, offering you a, a selection of these. The rest are available on the website. Um, so based on uh, this analysis, uh, we would then like to open the discussion on whether and how making represents a particular way of researching future FDA life. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the 13 research artifacts are made in the workshop. Um, and you can look on the website to see more. You can give you the address if you're interested. Um, but to get a, a flavour of the, the scale and the variety of, of these artefacts, we've selected four that we're going to um, describe and explain in a bit more detail now. Uh, and these were titled The Electricity Thief, uh, Project Artificial Hug, Smellscapes and Empathy Tree. Okay, so The Electricity Thief. Um, the what if question which this team posed uh, about the future was uh, what if we could engage with electricity in a tangible way. The research interests of the team were focused on electricity and the crucial role that it plays in facilitating daily activities, whilst at the same time being a taken for granted and invisible resource. Humans cannot sense electricity, so to compensate for this inability to see or sense electricity, the team designed a research artifact that could interact and make electricity uh, more visible. Can I go to the spill? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, shown in the video clip, the electricity thief travels uh, around the home, resting against electrified surfaces, slowly growing by converting ambient electricity into movement and inflation. The designers imagine a family in the near future discussing why the electricity parasite grew so large in the living room. <laughs> the artifact is an engagement with the electricity which is always being consumed around us. Okay, the second research artifact that we're going to tell you about today was Project Artificial Hook. The what if question posed by this team was what if technology contributes to alienating people? The team began from their research interest in the current tension that whilst technology creates greater connectivity, it can also leave people feeling increasingly alienated uh, and physically disconnected, with implications for mental health and anxiety. The, res the research artifact responds to this problem through uh, some further technical development, which is the artificial hug. Uh, so this garment simultaneously detects anxiety levels through heart rate sensors and engages in a hug mechanism when required. 
at the same time as offering a, a techno solution, uh, experimenting with the garment in use also raised important questions. What is the human hug? What makes it good? Is it the same for everyone? Will our facts be able to substitute hugs? And if so, what kinds of effects on humans and social relationships does this have? Okay, the third research artifact we'll show you today uh, was titled Smellscapes. The what if question posed by the team was what if we're confronted with unfamiliar smellscapes in our homes, neighbourhoods, workplaces and cities. The artifact emerged from research interests concerned with the importance of senses and of city smellscapes for everyday experience. The team explained, given the cultural conditioning of the senses, the smellscapes of everyday life in homes, neighbourhoods, workplaces and cities, play an important part in everyday experiences, emotions and encounters. Increased global mobility and climate change mean that unfamiliar smellscapes might be met more frequently, integrating with and altering the taking for the granted smellscapes of our lives. The research artifact was a charm bracelet, uh, which produced invisible research artifacts, smells, that would be controlled remotely by an app uh, and enter different spaces and contexts at different times and for different durations. And then the artifact would therefore enable the team to research questions of smell, such as how do people of different cultures negotiate unfamiliar smells in a variety of settings, what emotions to sense in and out of place evoke, what memories, knowledge and moral judgment to use to understand smells, and what vocabulary is used uh, to describe these experiences. The final research artifact is called Empathy Tree. The question this team posed was what if we could cultivate our empathic abilities by sensing like a tree? Empathy tree is a family heirloom consisting of jewellery and memories which are passed from one generation to another. It's also a biosensing device that invites the wearer to feel the world through a tree, through haptic and sonic effects produced by sensors on the tree that are then worn on the body in the jewellery. The jewellery is passed through generations of the family, accompanied by tree stories. The wearer, wearer therefore becomes aware of the profound involvement of humans and non-humans, and the multiple time states of existence that coexist in the present. For example, the same tree is experienced by different generations of the same family, uh, and also implications for caring for the tree across long uh, centuries of time. So, in the next part of the talk, talk we uh, reflect on how everyday life and the future were conceptualised in these uh, in these four artefacts, but more broadly in the 13 artefacts that were produced. And looking across the research artefacts, we have uh, three key observations about the conceptualisation of the everyday that, that seem to come from the, the making process. So firstly, the everyday is materialised. Indeed, the workshop was concerned with making artefacts. So that's unsurprising. Uh, however, of interest were the different types and scales of materiality which were viewed as central to everyday existence and well-being. And these materials included air, electricity, smells, pollutants, clothing, technologies, and nature. In the examples I've just presented, we see this in the electricity, the smells, and the tree. Um, within these, the artefacts, uh, different forms of materiality interact with human bodies and also with each other. And this draws attention to the invisible and taken for granted materials that are part and parcel of everyday action and possibly foregrounds the implications of the non human for anticipation as well as the human. Secondly, the everyday is conceived of, of as that experience through the body. Uh, social practices are embodied and future everyday life will continue to be experienced through the body. Um, for example, some of the artefacts focused on the body's senses, on how everyday sense making might change or be challenged in the future, uh, encourage, encouraging reflection on the role of senses in the present. And in contrast, other artefacts like the electricity feed create the limitations of human senses. Uh, with the research artefacts providing an enhancement of the senses so that new kinds of knowledge about invisible material worlds can be collected or invisible. Finally, the research artefacts emphasise the importance of the relationship between human bodies, the social practices which the body engages in, and human well-being and flourishing. For example, the simultaneous solution and provocation embedded in the pro in project Artificial Hub raise ethical questions about how present social problems should be addressed and how practices such as hugging 
might be transformed through technology. Okay. <laughs> so, um, regarding the uh, different ways of anticipating the future that we identified, um, we, we found uh, roughly, so this is the first analysis of, of our um, research artifact, so four different ways of anticipating the future. Um, and for each form of anticipate, anticipation, the artifact played a different role in relation to the future every day, as well as to its potential bearing of the present. So several of the research artifacts, in, including Empathy Tree, anticipate the future really as an open space, uh, full of potential. In this open future, new practices are imagined to emerge around existing technologies. The detailing out of such preferable practices has the effect of re revealing or enlarging a, a certain lack of problem in the present, uh, such as a lack of empathy for nature. <coughs> a second form of, of anticipation centers on new technological capabilities imagined to emerge in the future. The, the electricity thief forms a certain example of this, as well as the artificial hug. The making process explores possible practices that might emerge around them, and, result, and resulting research artifacts enable experiencing and discussing pros and cons of these future practices, uh, of future practices around these technologies. So such artifacts may uh, therefore inform policy or technology development in the present. Um, a third form is to anticipate current threats to escalate in the future. For example, the problem of social isolation in the artificial hub. Uh, this, this perspective views, views the future as a problem space. Uh, the research artifact makes the need to find solutions for it in the present more prominent. On the other hand, uh, this type of anticipation may hamper action in the present by painting a future in which the anticipated problem has been accepted and solved. Um, so this risk is less present in the fourth type of anticipation, where a certain aspect of the taken for granted anticipated future is materialized in the present, uh, such as, uh, for example, such as for example the engagement of smellscapes with futures of climate change and migration. Um, so what these artifacts do is make underexplored experiential aspects of anticipated futures. Uh, discussable in very practical terms. Such research artifacts can therefore open and enrich discourse around anticipated futures and reveal how the present is So it's not that each research artifact represents one of these uh, ways of anticipating the future, they, they are contained in many of them, but they are most prominent maybe in the ones that were highlighted. Um, okay, so to close with a, a bit of a reflection on, on these analyses, um, we, we found that uh, the making process we facilitated in the workshop brought design, design methods together with the diversity of research interest into the future every day. Um, and as we has, have touched on in the talk, the focus on making made it possible to get an aspect of the future uh, and the everyday to be foregrounded and for others to be backgrounded, um, while others were backgrounded. So in, in becoming aware of this, we noticed that not only we noticed not only how the everyday was handled in the workshop, but also some of the limitations of making as a method, that making as a method um, making these embedded conceptualizations and their uh, limitations explicit is an outcome from the workshop that can be usefully fed back into design research and maybe in other research research fields as well. Um, in his reflection on designing to know. Uh, Ron Wackery explains that the designing and making of a new thing is a particular way of asking if this thing exists today, how our everyday world will be altered. And this is reflected, reflective of, of the area of design research um, uh, and using artifacts for uh, asking questions. And, um, but our analysis of the artifacts, of the research artifacts from the workshop, draws attention to the fact that the everyday world is not one thing. Some aspects of the everyday world are more easily overlooked by methods of making than others. And I'll briefly touch upon three observations here, so three reflections. So one, in, in foregrounding uh, materiality and embodied experience, certain kinds of social concerns are not readily discussed or considered in so, uh, considered with such artifacts. So, for example, politics, inequalities, or power, they are much more difficult to materialize than other aspects of everyday life. 
Uh, secondly, uh, in working with our own bodies and uh, a limited set of materials that were available in the workshop, the everyday that was imagined oriented around Western and European concerns. Uh, this points to the importance of the maker, their social situation and subjective decision making in the kinds of future everyday that, that are considered. Um, so this is also inherent in the making, it's, it's a process of moving forward sort of with blinkers on because you have to make all these decisions all the time, it's quite intuitive. Um, and then the bodies that you do involve in the materials are very, um, very influential in the outcome. Uh, third and last is that uh, many of the artifacts were situated in a static future moment which has limited <coughs> dynamic or fluctuating qualities. So the depth was in the embodied experience of a specific practice in a specific moment. So there was depth, but the breadth, breadth was, <laughs> that's a difficult word, that was more difficult of course to, uh, to achieve or to engage with uh, through this method. Uh, as a result, the temporal embedding of practices in everyday life and the importance of the patterns and qualities of temporal experience risk being overlooked. Um, so in closing, our analysis may help uh, make design research more self-aware of the concepts of the everyday and the future which making relies upon. And more broadly, the workshop has led, has led us to question the forms of data that decisions about the future in the present rest upon. We therefore close with the question of how, and how making might with its focus on embodied experience, bearing in mind its focus on embodied experience and the material, bring aspects of possible, probable, and preferred futures that currently may remain unanticipated into everyday decisions. Yeah. Thank you. That was most certainly putting that D back into breath, the design. <laughs> Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, now the next people come up, uh, yes, comes up. Um, are there, please just get yourself ready, are there any immediate questions or clarifications, not big discussion points? Anyone coming in or out, now's the chance? Yes, uh, please. Yes, have a quick question about the, the futures that we're imagining. Did you want to participate about the future that we're thinking about a set were they working towards a future tenure about coming around? We didn't specify that at all in your right. So some weren't even explicitly talking about the future, but more about an alternative reality, that with timeless kind of way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And another quick one. How did you choose your participants? Um, we uh, we uh, sent out through yeah. the network, so we have the Everyday Futures Network, we sent out the call for, for participation, and then we selected them for their interest in the future every day, so they had to write an expression of interest for that, and then we, uh, we connected makers, more routine, routine makers or designers with more social science uh, background people. Okay, yeah. let's yeah. follow those up when we get practical <coughs> and technical and analytical yeah. afterwards. Thank you both very much, that was a very nice strong start and we look forward to discussing it. Our second paper takes us into a related field where we've heard earlier in the day, some of us together, some of us apart, about story making and storytelling, story sharing, story structuring, systems of storying, all of these things are in our future story making palette in a sense. But what is anticipatory storytelling? Pay attention. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, I am Dan Su, uh, and well, Steph will be here, but uh, I'll just talk very briefly about our research on anticipatory storytelling in design. Uh, so, <clears throat> talk briefly about storytelling first. I'm sure you all heard that uh, storytelling, well, if you haven't, you're hearing it now, that storytelling is considered as a very basic human right. We have even, uh, in fact, been called the storytelling animals. Uh, and what we all know, what we've all heard and it's been taught a lot, is that storytelling is one of the most effective communication tools. Well, that's a given fact, but the thing that's not so much discussed or so, or so well known is the fact that researchers now believe that storytelling is also uh, the greatest cognitive process of organizing our experience. 
Isn't that true storytelling that the brain uh, shapes memories? It's not memories are not perfect because and every time we call them, we then recreate these stories. Uh, storytelling processes again also are the way we uh, give meaning to what we perceive, what we see, is how we understand the world. And related to all of these, storytelling is also how the brain anticipates the future. When I see someone speak, act, behave in a certain way, my brain kind of creates a story uh, that anticipates what this person is going to do next. That kind of creates possible futures, and so I prepare myself for a certain reaction. Uh, so all of these cognitive advantages that comes uh, through storytelling made it so that evolution uh, kind of gave uh, perceptual primacy to it. So the best way to give perceptual primacy is, of course, to perceive stories as entertaining. So when you hear a storyteller tell a good story, you cannot stop watch, watch him or her tell it or watch the movie tell it. Um, so that's a very important uh, thing about storytelling because because we ha we have kind of evolved to perceive it as such, we also now define storytelling as having some kind of entertainment value. It should be uh, when when I say entertainment, it can be understood in different ways. But what I mean by that is that it kind of attracts your attention and is interesting. So there are a few similarities between design and storytelling. Well, first of all, uh, well, we can define design as like storytelling, a kind of an anticipation. Uh, but this time it's a bit more of a specific anticipation. It's about anticipating future needs or conditions of users, let's say. And envisioning products, or services, or systems to, well, prepare or get ready or answer the problems of this future. Uh, Sean also, for example, says that design is about uncertainty, it deals with uniqueness, and also deals with conflict. Conflict, you might also define it as a, a, a key point of storytelling. In all stories, there is a conflict that needs to be overcome. But in design, we might call it design problem that we try to solve. And we deal with a lot of uncertainties as we're trying to solve it. And what's expected both of design and of storytelling is to either find a unique or imaginative solution, or the way we try to find it should be at least different and, well, innovative. A little story about certain things that kind of shifted around. So, uh, because of the similarities between design and storytelling, and also because storytelling has gives us such big advantages, it's crucial for a designer to recognize how they can use storytelling in their processes. And it's not something new, it's not just something I'm saying. There have, in fact, been developed a lot of um, methods and ways of using storytelling in design. And design scenarios being the one that's most well known and most used, I think. Uh, and contrary to what the word kind of reminds us of, this is a technique that's not taken from the film industry, but from the military, who started using this approach to imagine what, or anticipate, what the enemy would do, so that they can prepare for it. So design scenarios are called a predictive tool. They're there to predict what can happen or what would happen. And because of that, they are considered by many design researchers as functional texts. So a lot of qualities of storytelling, that what qualities that we expect of storytelling, they say are lacking in design scenarios. Uh, things like good narrative composition, novelty entertainment, uh, the ability to reflect the complexity of the world, <coughs> also the, uh, giving the opportunity, offering the exploration of alternatives. They say these are crucial to design, but these design scenarios are not able to do any of these. But the weird thing is that when you look at the design literature, I mean, nearly everyone that talks about design scenarios keeps saying that good storytelling is a must if you want these design scenarios to succeed. succeed, succeed. So these things that relate to good storytelling are not in design scenarios, but they should be. But the problem is that the how. No one actually explains how a designer or uh, someone who's working in a design team, working in the design process, <coughs> is to achieve this good storytelling that they, they all expect. Um, and there are a few people who have a few tactics, but really no information exists on that. So what Stan and I did was to uh, try to think about 
how we can help designers or any stakeholder who partake in a design process in actually making better uh, stories, design stories. So we thought that we could develop a prototype uh, for them to use. And in order to develop this prototype, we got ideas from literature, cinema, narrative studies, so, and so we looked at what expert storytellers say about good storytelling in order to get some ideas of and how we can reflect them to a design process. Whew, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to be quick. Uh, so what, oh sorry again for the shifts, but what we kind of came up with at the end of our research was six, six uh, storytelling elements that really needs to be treated well and thought of if we want our storytelling to be good. Uh, character, which is obvious, I mean, but really we should think about what the goals of these characters is what they say in narrative studies. So these characters have a goal, but this goal is obstructed by a conflict, by let's say the design problem. And this situation creates certain emotions, and the emotions might in fact reinforce the conflict and the problem. All of this happens in a certain spatial and temporal location and time space. The two last things are more definite to the to good storytelling. The idea of a story arc, which means that the intensity of the actions throughout the story should change. If they don't change, they say that the story becomes very monotonous and boring. So, a change in the action intensity and also a change in the variety of the actions. So not just the same type of action that keeps becoming more stronger, but changing the type of action as well. So I will come in detail to these, but first let me tell you that we did uh, several iterations of, uh, let's say, workshops to develop a prototype. So we started with basic post-its, where people were creating stories, writing on these post-its, then this slowly became a visual tool, but we also changed the different aspects of this visual tool step by step to finally arrive at a kind of a, this is where we are right now, final prototype. And we tried it with uh, a, well, a huge group of eight, uh, and each, uh, in each group there were seven people. They were all, I mean, working in the same place, and they were the ones who asked us to come and try the same. So I can actually show other photos of them working on the time that allowed to show, but uh, we kind of had, we could photograph the results, not them working on them. So, okay, we are still working on analyzing the results, but along the way as we developed this prototype, we kind of had some conclusions and some discoveries, and these are what I would like to share with you. First of all, about character development, the first <coughs> storytelling element. Well, here's the <laughs> unfortunate solution that, that, is that this part is really important. And the idea of personas, if you're familiar with design, is something that deals with developing characters. And we tried, I mean, we had some trials in incorporating that into our sessions, and it didn't work. We weren't really able to manage all of them together. So, what we say for now is that this kind of approach that we're proposing should be uh, done as a kind of second stage after the development of a persona. So this kind of, the thing that we're using here works best when the participants already know about who these characters are. Also, another point is that not everything that we read and picked from narrative studies and literature always works in the context of design. Things like character roles. Uh, the idea of having a protagonist versus an antagonist is something that's, I mean, huge in literature and narrative studies. It definitely didn't work well in a design project because well, not all, there's not always an antagonist there. And who might be working together with just one protagonist. So we left that out pretty quickly and started just using stock images so that they could pick one to reflect the characters they we're kind of playing along with. The idea of the goal that the character has, which was at the beginning part of the character kind of <coughs> versus the conflict, the design problem of the overall story. 
They used to be separate, and when they were separate like that, again, it didn't work well. Because although when you look at the classical narrative theories, the goal is always part of the character design or development. In terms of design, well, sometimes it's not about just, well, most of the time it's not about one person. We try to design for many people at the same time, so it's also when they're working together, our participants, they were actually thinking about one of their goals. So they were most of the time thinking about the goal of the whole company, let's say. So we placed the goal and the conflict together on a card that we made as visible as possible so that they would focus on this throughout the process, throughout the workshop. Because if they don't focus on what the goal and the conflict is, there was always the risk that they could go off chart and start making a spy story that had nothing to do with the design subject. This risk, I will keep repeating, it was one of the big risks of this approach about storytelling. But also the good thing is that once you have these two opposing forces together, it also allowed many of our participants to, at one moment, I mean, along the way, to say, you know what, this is not really our problem. We have another issue that should be, in fact, I mean, handled. So they were able to reframe the problem, which I think was one of the biggest opportunities that this prototype uh, gave us. <coughs> the story arc. So there is this very classical approach of, uh, they call fight experiment, the triangular approach of the story actions kind of increasing towards a climax point in the story and then falling down. We, at the very beginning, we were explaining this to the participants and saying that they should apply it to their story. Uh, of course, this didn't work. They were not able to listen to us and do what we were expecting. So we talked about how to make a visual way to make them follow this idea. So we created a story map. But as you see here, this idea of this triangle pyramids is gone. Because as we were switching to this, to this visual approach, we realized that instead of focusing on this rising action, it was more interesting to pick Kurt Vonnegut's idea about the good fortune of the characters changing through the story. So there is not a strict line that we force them to follow, but we kind of give them the idea that towards the climax, the good fortune should fall down. So, as you see here, they are the ones who are creating the art themselves, and it depends every time on their specific story, they can change it and play with it. The other thing, with this graph, this story map, let's say, we were also able to incorporate the idea of plot points. <clears throat> plot points are, the expert says, specific different events that kind of follow each other. And they are what make the story more interesting. Because one action kind of refers to what will follow next. And this is what makes the art go up and down, which makes a story more interesting. And this was, again, uh, I think one of the biggest improvements in terms of design scenario that this prototype brought in because once we had these plot points they were able to anticipate what the next move would be. So they were also able to reflect that on the storyboard that they were creating. And instead of I mean staying blankly looking blankly at the page like you were saying this morning and trying to figure out actions, this kind of uh, helped them think about what will happen next, how it can happen. Another thing that, uh, okay, I'm not going to talk about, about setting and timing because this is something that we have figured out. <laughs> um, as you see, I mean, the setting cards are not really visually effective. Timing, it kind of works, but so that you not just waste time with them. Let me just switch first to this one. The plot devices cards are another way we help them get ideas. Uh, these plot devices, like flashback, again, helped with breaking the monotony. And they were able to discover new things and details about the story. Once you have a flashback, you get the chance to look at the past of a character. Discover something there that kind of re would reflect on how he or she would act in the future. <coughs> or inner dialogue, you suddenly will have a deeper look at the psyche of the character, for example. So, these ideas were 
measurements for creative ideas that were really useful, um, we found with our participants. Uh, okay, coming back to this very big issue that we had. Uh, emotions are a huge part of storytelling, and everybody says that being able to express emotions and having the audience feel it is one of the big opportunities that is it's, it's there in storytelling. But how to have the participants use that? We, our first idea was to use the idea of genre. Again, being influenced by narratives, that is this big topic of genre was a great way to deal with emotions, how to feel in general, like fear, anticipation, I don't know where I was, let's say <laughs> excitement. But this became really problematic. Again, when we use the word genre and we use the words like drama, horror, suddenly we started having Hollywood scenarios, not design scenarios that were really intended to solve something. Another thing, we used, we gave them these emoji stickers. And I mean, all of our participants really loved them. You cannot believe how much they loved them, <laughs> which became very distracting. They really forgot all about what they were doing. They were just taking them all around the map. <laughs> so we said, this is kind of taking us off route again. We left that one out as well. So we made a less fun way of giving <laughs> these small boring cards, which in fact were much more useful. Well, this idea again could be that needs to be developed. So it can be more effective. But for now, at least we have improved our approach. I'm finishing. Okay. Just to say that, oh, okay, the more is important. I'm just gonna go through it. The first for design scenarios. Not to scare people, but to actually have more of an impact. Uh, because it makes it more user-centered, well, I should say human-centered. It has more relevance when you have a better storytelling. And what's great is that it opens up more alternatives. Because um, it really gives us different ideas where they could follow. And the best part was that when they're working with storytelling, the collaboration was wonderful. I mean, we worked with very uh, introverted groups even. None of, not, not one of them had a problem participating and they all say they had a wonderful time and they learned a lot about people that they knew for a long time because they had the time, they had the possibility to reflect as they were creating these stories, which was the number one point. This is the last slide, <laughs> sorry. It is the last slide. Okay. <laughs> Um, just to say that it's like this prototype's uh, aim is not just to create a good storytelling, its main aim was also to follow up with creating design ideas. So they were creating intervention points and developing these different ideas, which was really expanding the design space. And this is how we kind of judged whether the design scenarios were good or not. Thank you. <laughs> I think there are a number of questions as a design researcher about how that workshop and those tools can all be placed and understood, and we can take some of those up in more detail, I think, later on. Later. But are there any particular things from your side immediately you need to ask? One question. One question. I, so, a lot of storytelling derives from a specific understanding of story and plots which is linear and follows the individual hero. So did you work with a critical perspective on what a story could be in any way? Well, uh, I didn't have time to explain it, but uh, the, the thing is, I mean, there were very different ways we could approach it, but we kind of picked one way. Okay. We had to, so okay. just very quickly. Okay. So these are the kind of pathways in the garden of walking paths that we will come back to this afternoon. I'd like to introduce Astrid and Luz, who are going to give us a particular gaming version on frontiering. If I can try and get some in words as the bilinguist in the room, <laughs> these are things that are in being, becoming, but have a kind of dynamic agency. But what in the world will that be? <coughs> That's a good question. Let's try to answer it. So I know it's the end of the day, so we'll try to make this very dynamic. And, uh, and as interesting as possible. So, uh, I'm Joost, let me get out of the way here. I'm Joost, this is Astrid. We're both at the uh, Copernicus Institute for Sustainable Development at Utrecht University, and we have a bunch of other affiliations. 
and we'd like to talk about the use of games for futuring and what some new frontiers are. I'm going to give a more general overview and Asit's going to present some work that she did in Japan, which is really fantastic stuff. So I think that quite a few of us know that games have a long history in using foresight, you know, all the way from kind of RAND, uh, using it in the 50s and before that, and war game, etc. Right? This is, this is not really new stuff. Uh, but just briefly, there are a lot of collaborative links to, uh, between games and scenarios because games can offer a space for narrative development uh, and also for games as models as a way to experiment with system behavior, system outcomes. Um, what's really very interesting about certain specific types of games, uh, specifically simulation games and multiplayer role-playing games and these kinds of things is that there's a real strong focus on actor perspectives. Right? So you can step into different roles and you can, you can play around with these roles and you can, uh, you can experience what it's like to take these different perspectives and see what others are doing. And this is something that is not normally possible in a model. And it's also quite different from how you develop a scenario. Um, of course, there are a lot of hybrids possible there. Um, a lot of the work that you see in the use of games uh, is very much foresight work, right? So these are participatory planning games, uh, they're analytical kind of planning games. Um, so we've been investigating uh, how, what, what else is possible? Uh, so, beyond this work of games and for use of games and foresight, the, the, the game sector has grown very large, right? It's a, we were walking through, uh, through London, through the subway, through the underground, I should say, yesterday, and we saw, you know, almost as many posters of mainstream games as we saw of movies. Uh, games are now a bigger sector than the movie industry. Um, but there are a lot of different trends that are going on that are very interesting from a futures perspective. Uh, so we, where we can kind of broaden our idea of using games for foresight and so in a planning mode, but again, from to engaging with them uh, as a tool to explore the future in many different dimensions, also embodied and emotional, etc., etc. So what's happening? So there's a huge growth of uh, in the game sector in terms of the players. This is globalizing. Uh, age differences are, you know, they're, uh, the demographics are changing in a positive way. Um, there are new game development tools. There's new support for people to build games. Uh, in a way that wasn't possible before open source platforms that let people build games relatively more easily and you don't need to have quite as much programming knowledge and that's opening up the space. Um, very importantly to the development of um, game sectors that online platforms for distribution make it possible for smaller designers to spread their games around and get them get people interested and bought etc etc and they don't need big publishers anymore right? And so all of this has led, in, in, and this is a trend that's been going on for some time now, uh, to the development of the indie game sector, where there's an explosion of games that are developed by smaller teams and that don't have to be super commercial, right? They can be, they can be, but they can also be very strange. They can be expressive. They can, can be critical. They can be, they can be political, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because there's a lower risk, it's easier to develop them, it's easier to distribute them, it's easier to get attention to them. Although, of course, this market is also flooding with games, right? So in a way, it's also sometimes more difficult. Um, and there are games where new content can be created. Of course, I think many of us know that uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are becoming kind of mainstream things. And not virtual reality is still somewhat niche, right? But we have these devices that people are buying now. I've got a VR set at home, and then. Um, uh, an augmented reality, you know, Pokemon Go and this kind of stuff, and people are really looking into what we can do with integrate, integrating these kind of game realities in everyday life. A nice link to the, the previous presentation is that what we see is that a lot of games are building huge communities of people storytelling about game experiences. Right? And while you're listening to me, think a little bit about what this could mean for futures games, right? And I'll explain that a little bit more. But so storytelling about gameplay experiences that are games, especially games that are kind of open, designed to be open in terms of their narratives, that just create millions of people interested in storytelling and kind of archaeology and sleuthing out what's go what goes on. Those of you who know the game Dark Souls, maybe it's maybe only familiar to a few people, but this is this enigmatic open world and, and there's a huge kind of college industry behind this, where people are trying to figure out what's the story, what happened, etc., etc. So there's a huge opportunity there as well. And all of these things go pretty far beyond what is you, how games are typically used in foresight context, right? Right. So we can do a lot of things with this. Sorry, I'm going quite fast and be careful, but be mindful of the time. Another component that we're very interested in. I'm coming at this from a future scenarios perspective, or both of us are coming at this from a future scenarios perspective, where we see games being used for foresight and we see a big problem in that they are pre-designed often, right? You make a game 
The game has a very particular, what they call procedural rhetoric. It gives you the rules, it tells you what rules there are, it tells you what to do. Uh, it's a little bit different with tabletop role-playing games, but generally that's the case. When we're doing future scenarios work, participatory scenarios work, we're breaking open the space, we're letting people make their own scenarios, think about drivers themselves. So we're a little bit annoyed by this, right? So what can we do instead? We can use game co-design as a process of inquiry into the systems that we're interested in. And I'm coming at this from a kind of broad sustainability focus. So building games together with people who are coming from the very different directions to a problem can help, them, can help everybody think about what are the rules here, what are the roles, what could change in these roles, etc., etc. So it becomes really a participatory design process. Just an, an example of this is a, pro, is a project by a colleague Niels Verland, who built water management games with Ugandan farmers, trying to get them to express and, uh, and to explain how their daily practices work and what they're dealing with and the conflicts that they're dealing with. And then they played these games with policymakers in Uganda. Right, so, so you get a, you get a, with policymakers, with the farmers there, you get a possibility for people to share their ideas and their understandings of how these systems work, how their roles work, and how their worlds work. Yeah? And this kind of game co-design, I'm also very interested in, uh, in this because you can design games quickly as a kind of process of inquiry, very close to specific policy questions. So you don't have some plan to have any kind of general game that's sort of dealing with sustainability in a general sense and that people are supposed to learn from it even though they've been in the field for 40 years, right? You build something very specific that's dynamic and it's all about the process and it's not about the product. So, okay, fine, so what do we do with all of this? I don't have a lot of time to go into that deeply uh, because we want to listen to a very nice example specifically, but as, a, as an overview, um, obviously you can use this increased capacity in game co-design in, uh, in developing prototyping quickly, etc., etc. as part of the classic four-step process. You have a, work, a scenario workshop, and part of the scenario workshop, people build scenarios, etc., etc., and then you develop games along with them as well and start prototyping and playing around with these games to pre experience and participate in, in future settings. Um, but we can go further than this. And uh, we can also use game design to really open up, if we do it at a larger scale with many, many more people, we can develop a lot of games. Each game can represent a different world, a different, a different perspective on the future that you can step into and play around with. And then finally, uh, what we can, what, what's very interesting to me is that if you look at what game, what futures are explored in the commercial game sector at the moment, or even in the indie game sector, a lot of dystopia, right? A dystopia is easy to build. You don't have to make elaborate cities. Everybody's dead, so you, you know it's easier to program, and you can shoot, and you know it's all allowed. Your time is up. Sorry, your time is up. Oh. No, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so all of that, all of that is easier uh, to do, but uh, there is a lack of a diversity of futures in. Um, you know, in the game sector, and what we are very interested in exploring is what, you, what if you go to game development, game developer conferences, and you talk about pluralizing and diversifying the futures that are being explored in commercial games. So all the way from enhancing classic four-step processes to really opening up these other things. Now we'll talk about these other steps in a little bit more in a minute. And I want to hand over to Asit, who's going to talk about her fantastic work uh, in a multi-method approach using games and other four-step methods in Kyoto. Thank you, Yoss. <coughs> Um, yeah, so like Joe said, I'm going to give a bit more of a concrete example of the use of futures games, uh, which we did in Kyoto in Japan, and we also combined them with other futures methods. Um, so Joe's already shortly mentioned that games are specifically useful um, to study and explore complex systems. So the global complex system that we chose uh, for this case study is uh, urban food systems. And they are very complex and they are also under a lot of stress at the moment from, for example, climate change, um, overpopulation. And these are challenges that are uh, related to the maybe even more complex concept of the Anthropocene, which is this unprecedented era that we're at the start of where humanity is uh, considered a major environmental force for the first time. Um, so the question is, is there a way um, that we can uh, anticipate or maybe even shape a good anthropocene for urban food systems, so a more prosperous, just, and ecologically diverse future. And there is a group of researchers that answers uh, this question with a resounding yes, and that's um, the Seeds of Good Anthropocenes project. Uh, it's led by Eleanor Bennett, and um, they wrote a paper and they made a database in which they collect um, promising or successful initiatives that already exist, and they contribute to um, a better anthropocene. 
And then the authors argue that by um, combining, reconfiguring, and exploring these already existing seeds, um, we can show outlines of root anthropocenes. And these go beyond dystopias and utopias, which are, as Jos already mentioned, um, useless at best and damaging at worst. Um, and instead, they show us a plurality of different futures. And we um, tried to uh, test this in Kyoto, in Japan, which is a city of 1.5 million people. Um, it has a unique food culture that's UNESCO World Heritage protected, but also it faces a set of challenges with is it <coughs> um, a sort of an exaggeration of the challenges that many other OECD countries or cities also face. So they have an aging population, uh, only 15% of Japan's land is arable, and 94% uh, of Japan's population lives in an urban area. So um, in Kyoto, we um, set up a series of interviews, workshops, and focus groups with uh, futures methods that can anticipate normative futures, which was necessary because good anthropocene is a very normative concept. Um, so we started with a series of visioning workshops. Uh, so visioning is an uh, activity where people are asked to envision um, a moment in the future and envision what the world looks like at that point in time, or what they want it to look like in this case. Um, and then we did uh, backcasting focus groups where we took those visions and worked, made a pathway back from the future to the present. Uh, and then finally, we did two futures gaming uh, workshops uh, where we um, played two games. One computer game, uh, Let's Kyoto, which is a food systems game where the players play uh, different food system actors, such as <coughs> farmer, uh, local supermarket, um, in consumers of different income levels. And um, the players pass the controller around, and uh, at the end they vote on different policy measures. And as the rounds progress, uh, the food system changes before their eyes. And the other game we played was the FPC Simulator. Um, and in this game, uh, the players play a food policy council, which is a gov governance instrument where um, different food system actors come together and uh, try to push for food systems change. And in this game, um, the Food Policy Council gets um, different stacks of cards, which uh, have existing seeds on them from Kyoto, Japan, or the world. So these are the cards. Um, they draw these three of these cards, and they have to reassemble them and make a, a Food Policy Council plan for which they get uh, a budget with this um, game money. And then at the end, they have to roll a dice, see if the plan is successful, um, improve it, and the goal is to get as many successful plans um, in the amount of time as possible. So, from this series of interventions, uh, first of all, the, from the beginning interviews, we extracted five main themes that came back again and again. Uh, so, there was a big desire for transparency in the food system, uh, for local production, for local consumption. Uh, people wanted the quality and quantity of food in the future to be high. Um, they were very interested in uh, food safety, it was a big topic for them. And uh, finally, they were interested um, in a future that uh, allowed for more engagement of everybody with their local food system. And then we fed these uh, visions back into the back of the focus group. Um, so there were different uh, pathways that resulted from that, but very generally, um, the pathways were all sort of followed this pattern that um, in the long term that was a place for big institutional change. For example, a basic income. That's something that would be implemented right before the actual vision becomes realized. So then participants figured out that in the mid to long term they would have to sort of gather public support for this big institutional change. And then on the short term was a place for personal uh, interventions. So it's sort of the question what could we do tomorrow? What could we do? What could we make our family do, for example? Um, we also did um, a small survey at the end of every focus group in which the people also indicate that um, they came up with concrete plans, um, which were mostly these activities that they could do right away. Um, they had a lot of new ideas, and they also knew quite a lot of other people, but they also, all of them, met some other people. And the interesting was that um, many new ideas that they heard also came from other participants. So for the selection of the participants, we also tried to select people that already engaged in seeds, or for example, they had a farmer's market, or they tried to push for change um, in the local government. 
So interestingly enough, they also sort of um, benefited from each other's ideas and activities. Um, then the video game. The video game was actually a prototype that was made by game development students in Utrecht. So it wasn't quite finished and it wasn't quite perfect. Um, so the results were also quite mixed. Um, people, some people learned about the food system from it, some said they didn't really. Um, and also insights in different roles was kind of mixed results. But what was interesting was that um, they, we also asked them for points for improvement for this prototype. And from the points for improvement that they saw, actually, um, they sort of demonstrated that they had a really sharp insight in their own food system. For example, they said, um, well, we're the large scale consumers, so what, where's the power in this game um, that's really missing? Or there should be a cap on local production because we're in Japan and it's just not possible to produce everything ourselves. Um, and then, Finally, the card game. Um, the plans that the FPCs came up with uh, in the first round, we gave them kind of a limited budget, and we found that the ideas were not so new. So, for example, um, they came up with a local certification scheme, which is kind of a, something that perhaps maybe even already exists. But then in the second workshop, we gave them an unlimited budget, and the ideas were also very much more um, sort of original. For example, this uh, Kodomo Kingdom, this uh, group came up with the idea to make a big food system sort of theme park for kids in an abandoned warehouse that even had their own uh, currency that could only be used by kids and not by adults. It was very elaborate and kids could farm there and sort of make use of um, empty buildings that uh, come with the shrinking population, for example. Um, and also, it turned out that um, people were quite enthusiastic at the end of the game. So they indicated that they um, had a good idea what it would be like to be in a food policy council. They were interested to be in a food policy council. Uh, they heard a lot of new ideas. The only thing that they were kind of ambiguous about was the role playing. So they didn't really get many new insights from playing different roles. Um, so. It was a small case study, but we kind of concluded that different methods do fulfill different tasks. And in this case, um, the visioning and backcasting um, generated the qualitative insights and gave the um, concrete points of action. Um, and then the gaming actually activates people and it really works as a simulation where people learn a lot. Um, and also the different parameters, um, so also new government modes of the food policy council and use of seeds. Um, was beneficial, but there were some limitations like um, balancing the control and these types of things. It's very culturally specific and time consuming, um, but those are things I think Jos and I want to uh, explore in the future. All right, I have one final slide. No, you don't. Okay. Unless you shove it and stop talking. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> So here's some images. Here, go have some images. Okay. And then, <laughs> just, no, 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 my fault as well. It's okay. We are very happy. And we've got three presenters. Um, we've got Melissa Hawkins, Lars Hammersworth, and Sun Han Lee. Lars was going to present two papers, but has um, withdrawn one of them, and he's just presenting the first paper, and he'll be coming up with the second paper. And the first paper, we might have some discussion about the second paper. Um, people will talk from between 15 to 20 minutes. I'll stop the people at 20 minutes. Um, so that we've got enough time for, for discussion afterwards. Right, over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk Um, we're looking at uh, the problematics of organising in schools 
in particular, as part of my thesis, I'm looking at performance management and that policy. Um, and we're using complexity theory to problematize um, the issues of, of performance management. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to you in a little bit about how I think complexity theory links up with ideas of anticipation. Uh, forgive me if I don't quite uh, uh, align with perhaps uh, different people's ideas of anticipation. But what I find quite interesting coming to this conference is I think that word anticipation means different things to different people. So I'm quite new at the field of anticipation, so I've been sort of picking up on some of the, the, the main theorist ideas. Um, so a little bit of background about me and the rationale for looking at performance management. Um, I was a classroom teacher working in schools for about eight years and I was working at the time of quite a lot of change in education, so quite a lot of policy change, uh, change in governments um, and the sort of increasing deregulation I suppose of, of policy to schools. So one of the main policies I was quite interested in uh, was performance management and I became quite irritated really of how that policy was evolving and I didn't quite know why I was getting irritated at this policy. It became very complicated the way that it was being developed in our school and I just thought it didn't really fit what schools were really like. Um, the 2012 policy uh, had a change where there was a link, a direct link to pay, performance related pay. Um, and I thought, again, I wasn't quite sure, but I, I wasn't really happy with that idea. Um, so I started my PhD, and uh, Chris James, my supervisor, suggested to me to look at complexity theory. It's not something that I've looked at before. But upon reading that literature, I realised, actually, this was a way in which I could critique uh, policy, such as performance management. And it was giving me an idea of why, perhaps, the policy wasn't quite matching up to the reality of schools. Um, so, looking at that literature of complexity theory, I suddenly dived in, and it, it's, a, it's a really big field, I would imagine similar to the field of anticipation. Um, lots of different concepts, lots of different theories. Um, I don't know, uh, I know there's some in the room that know an awful lot about complexity theory, so I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, but it is quite diverse. It's, and the, the idea behind it, oh, really <laughs> uh, the ideas behind it, I would say, have, have been there for many, many years. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's all right. <laughs> um, and and, and the, the general idea is you've got two ways of looking at the world. One of the ways of looking at the world is closed um, and uh, you can easily uh, measure it uh, and you can reduce it and you can research it by looking at parts of it. And the other idea from the complexity theory or complex thinking <coughs> is that the, the, the world and the social world and humans and organisations are made up of open, complex systems. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why it becomes really problematic to research them in the bits. Um, so, Chris and I, we were looking at the literature, and as it's so big, and there's lots of different things going on, but the way that I dealt with it, um, and I'm sure uh, there are issues with this way, but the way I dealt with it was by trying to take all of these main ideas from complexity theory and try and synthesise it into some sort of meaningful framework for teachers at school. So Chris and I came up with the idea of uh, complex evolving loosely in these systems, which very much draws on the ideas of complex adaptive systems, complex evolving systems, uh, and a little bit about com uh, Ralph Stacey's mm -hmm. complex responsive processes, but I think some of the ideas are a little bit different because we still keep the idea of, um, of system more for making sense of, of what we're looking at than anything else. Um, so just to give a little brief idea of some of the concepts of complex systems uh, theory, in case you're not too sure, the, the main ideas of this theory is that, it, that there's non-linear cause and effect, there's emergence, so new order is created uh, through self-organisation, there's heterogeneity in the system which makes life very difficult because you can't work out what people are going to be doing, uh, small changes might entail large effects or, or vice versa, there's often competitive pressures uh, between perhaps ideas within the system or people. Uh, the system self-organises, so although you have 
perhaps um, a very hierarchical and bureaucratic and, and top-down system, actually, it, it, that becomes problematic when you use uh, organisations like that because of this idea that complex systems self-organise without a central uh, person. Uh, the system co-evolves, uh, the history of the system is important, so the past is important, uh, and, and what happens in the present and future. The idea of loose linking comes from uh, Carl White's idea of using coupled systems, um, which is the idea that, that open complex systems are made of subsystems, and those subsystems are loosely linked together, loosely coupled together, so they are responsive to each other, but they remain distinctive. So an example of this might be the head teacher's office at the school and uh, the classroom teacher's um, classroom. And uh, there might be a loose link in there um, between motives, thoughts, uh, interactions, and so on. Um, and problems might come when you try and tighten that system, uh, perhaps, which is what happens with uh, performance management. And the whole is different to the part, so that's why it becomes difficult to look at the whole system. Um, so the problems, are, the implications of this, of using complexity theory, is that there's problematics associated with measuring the system due to non-linear cause and effect, evaluating, working out who's responsible for what, again due to this non-linear cause and effect. There's issues to do with prediction because of the heterogeneity of agents and controlling the system due to self-organisation. And, and finally, reducing and understanding that system becomes quite difficult because you're only ever looking at part of it. So now I link um, to uh, how I think complexity links to these ideas of anticipation, and I think it uh, under uh, underruns a lot of the ideas. Um, I've taken the idea of uh, just two two aspects of these links. Um, I'm sure there are many more, and I might not have got this thing quite right. But this is how I think it links. So one of the main things that I'm interested in is the idea of prediction, um, and I think both uh, anticipation and complexity look at that. So there's a couple of uh, quotes on, on the screen, and for me, those quotes tell me that both theories are really interested in how it seems to be our human nature that we try and um, perhaps uh, predict, um, in order to make sense of the world. So we kind of can't get out of that because that's what we sort of naturally try and do in order to make order and, and try and make sense. And, and Because otherwise we'll be living in, a, in, in it may be in our minds, a very cha chaotic world. Um, however, I think both aspects of anticipation and complexity are, are really interested in, well, that goes wrong. You know, our, we can't really uh, accurately predict anything that's going to happen in the future due to heterogeneity, non-linear cause and effect, and so on. So it's quite interesting. I think both of these sort of theories sort of say, okay, we try and do things, but actually that's not going to play out in reality in the future. Um, and, and prediction is going to be wrong, and we adapt, or sometimes we might maladapt. So it's a sort of problem problematic aspects of, of uh, what these two theories tell us that I'm interested in to do with policy. And the other link that I think uh, is quite similar between both is non-linear cause and effect. So that um, idea that you have lots of different variables, uh, you can't just have input, process, output in complex systems such as a school, and that has issues to do with um, responsibility. So if you have a, a teacher uh, responsible for the class, and then you have a performance management policy that says, okay, you have a really good teacher, they're going to do their stuff, and then the, the pupils are going to come out at the end um, doing really well. Well, you know, obviously, uh, things that are outside of the teacher's control, are they taken into account? Are the pupils around each other taken into account? I'm not sure that is all the time with performance management. So, um, looking at the literature, uh, again, based on just these two aspects, prediction and, and non-linear cause and effect, and when I read my uh, slides back again, I was thinking, gosh, um, I'm not quite sure how all of these points link, link back to prediction. I think it's just a very loose idea. Uh, and I'll talk more about um, some of my initial work that I've done in schools uh, through case studies in a bit. 
Um, so again, picking up on prediction, um, performance management, the nature of anticipatory complex systems creates problematic understanding. Performance management systems are often too static. Uh, this is from what I've been looking at um, with performance management in the policy uh, side of things now. Uh, and they just seem to be too inflexible. So that's the sort of the reading side of things before I go in and actually see what's happening in practice. Um, performance management systems often assume prediction is unproblematic and infallible. So going back to the idea that actually we try and do all of this prediction but it's not necessarily going to work out um, uh, correct. And one other thing that I'm quite interested in is the fact that um, how the future develops will depend on individual perception of primary tasks. So what the main purpose of education is and I think the government has perhaps one idea, some teachers have other ideas, and different schools have different ideas again. It's quite fairly similar, I've been finding, but actually there's a few differences. So government perhaps might have more of a focus on literacy and numeracy, uh, other teachers might have a uh, think like more well-rounded individual. Um, and that will affect how anticipation and perhaps how the future develops. Um, the other link, uh, again, in the literature of performance management in schools, non-linear cause and effects, as I've already been speaking about, it causes problematics of measuring and assigning responsibility. That's a, a big interest of mine. Uh, non-linearity will create ambiguity and uncertainty. And again, I don't know whether that's uh, being thought of enough in performance management policies in schools. Uh, performance management systems often assume cause and effect, effect to be linear. That's on the sort of surface of it. Um, so now um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what I've been doing in schools. So it's a, it's a work in progress. I haven't finished my uh, collection of data yet. Hope to do that by Christmas uh, uh, of this year. So uh, going in and speaking to teachers. So what I've been doing is I've got back three case studies so far, three very different schools, an alternative uh, provision school, a very, very large secondary school, and a very small uh, primary school, voluntary control primary school. So I've been in, I've been speaking to head teachers and different teachers working within those schools to see actually what problematics do they find in performance management? Do they link up with these theories of complexity? Um, and what I've been finding so far is that in all three schools, uh, even uh, the school with, that provides alternative provision, it doesn't have to follow the national curriculum, it's quite free in what it does, all three schools, performance management remains quite static. Uh, so it's a one-off event, it's not thought of as that uh, important. We have a review at the beginning of the year uh, and a review at the end, so it's not really uh, anything else happening in between then. So you have targets set as a teacher. Those targets will um, be different depending on the school. Some of them are statistical, so the teacher has to get 80% um, of their class to level, a certain level, level five by the end of the year. And others might be a bit more generic, those targets. Um, those targets, um, because of the policy change in, quite recently, just in the words itself, it gives an indicator of how performance management has changed. It's gone from performance management to performance appraisal. So there's what I find uh, speaking to teachers in schools is the development aspect of it, which is probably, uh, in terms of complexity theory and anticipation, uh, the development side of teachers is very important and working together and collaborating together. That has been lost. Uh, to a certain extent in these three schools, the, the focus isn't on it as much. Um, I found that the process remains bureaucratic, um, so there's, there's one person, the head teacher, that's usually responsible for getting the policy. As I mentioned earlier, the policies have become deregulated, so the actual policy from government is quite general <coughs> for the schools to uh, work with them as they, as they see fit. They do have to be all linked to pay though. But even so, so the, the policy remains quite bureaucratic. Um, anticipation, um, I don't know if I've quite got this right, but I think from speaking to teachers, um, teachers are, uh, some teachers and some head teachers are, are very worried about the link to pay. 
Um, so they lower their expectations possibly, or there's the worry that, that teachers might lower their expectations in order to get their pay at the end of the year. Um, so that idea of what consequence might happen to them uh, might well lead to game, game playing. Um, evaluation of course management is guided by perception of the primary task, so it is very much depending on which school uh, and which teacher I'm talking to and which school will depend how that policy is created. And the nature of liability and prediction is often not questioned, and I think that goes back to that idea of performance management is just seen as a, uh, a yearly uh, annual thing, and actually it's um, you predict targets and perhaps these things change, uh, but not much has, has really been thought about that. Do I need to Right, okay. So um, I, I welcome what, any right now. No, Okay, so um, uh, I, I welcome a question. So if I just go on, I, I won't talk about non-linear cause and effect, but uh, the implications I feel for this, the, the overall implication, is that I think that um, using complexity, using the ideas of anticipation, I think we need to gain more of an understanding at all levels, at school level and at government level, of what schools are and what we can and cannot do um, and what responsibility we can assign to uh, each other, and perhaps we need to think about a different approach. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks very much. You go on. <laughs> Too much. All right, our next speaker is Lars Hammersford. Um, once you take the and introduce you any further than that, you can introduce your own topic. Yeah, my title is The Future of Education, and the other title is The Problem of Cultivating the Unique Human Capacities Required in a World of Rapid Change. And I'm at the Danish School of Education at the Aarhus uh, University. <coughs> um, first, let me start by uh, saying a little bit about this link between education and anticipation. I think there's two major ways of looking at it. There's uh, education as anticipation, and that is uh, education as a preparation for not just working in future society but also living in future society and uh, it has uh, a broad scope it's in 10, 20, 40 or 60 years uh, years time so this raises the question what is important to learn today to be able to, to, to uh, work and live in the uh, future society of tomorrow and today uh, the conditions of education is that we live in times of rapid change, it seems. And this, this is a major change be, because we can no longer uh, rely on tradition as an anticipatory model as we used to. So there is a, a need, when, when we live in times of rapid change, there is a need for future studies. There, there is a need for, if not predicting, then having a sense of uh, where I am. Where are we going here? Yeah. And uh, the other link between the two is anticipation as education. And that is uh, that uh, we learn students to uh, be capable of uh, anticipating the future. That is the theme of anticipation as part of the curriculum. And the question here is, which capacities should we cultivate? And, and should the students be cultivating? And, 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 and the second question is, when are they going to cultivate these uh, capacities? Is it in daycare? Is it in school? Is it in universities? And the second question is, how are they going to cultivate these capacities? And in order to answer these questions, we have to know what are the nature of the capacities that we need to cultivate in the future. So these are some of the very big questions that I try to, to uh, uh, to, to answer this paper and other papers. My analysis uh, strategy of future studies is diagnosis of the times. And this is actually a very old analysis strategy of future studies, but it's, it is somehow overlooked. And I've, uh, I've written a chapter in, in Poli's Handbook of Anticipation on diagnosis of the times. 
But let me just say uh, uh, a few words uh, about it. Diagnosis, oftentimes, is about diagnosis tendencies. And uh, a tendency is a pattern in the uh, process of change. It is, at the, it is about the direction of the, the process of change. So, diagnosis of the times is to uh, uh, identify and interpret signs of change in the times and interpret them as these patterns, these directions uh, of time. And uh, usually, um, this diagnosis is guided by historical analysis of uh, what were the patterns and directions of change uh, um, in the past. So, this is a tradition that goes back to the founding fathers of sociology. Because what they were interested in, what to understand, what is modern society? And uh, the tendencies they diagnosed was, for instance, individualization, which is still a big topic uh, in sociology. The other one is modernization of, uh, of uh, society. But the first diagnosis to be ever made, according to Michel Foucault, was actually the philosopher Immanuel Kant's diagnosis of enlightenment in his famous text, What is Enlightenment? And what Kant saw was that there, there, there were a tendency that people um, uh, were able to make use of their own reason without guidance, without relying on, <laughs> without relying on authorities. And uh, the reason why I saw it all was that he saw signs in his time that, as, as he says, we see clear, clear uh, indications that people are now being opening up to this to make use of their own, own reason. And this is also a tendency, I think, that you, you can say is still, uh, is, is still a topic uh, today, relevant today. So, um, it's just to, to give you uh, an impression uh, of it. Uh, and you might say that in sociology, there are two major kinds of uh, future studies strategies. There is diagnosis of the times, and then there is sociology of future society, um, for example, John Uri has made a, a lot of, of, of work uh, on that. And the difference is that sociology of future studies is not about diagnosing tendencies, but it's about building scenarios, scenarios of future society. Um, and, 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 this is a diff and there's a different fo focus between these two future studies strategies. <clears throat> Diagnosis of the times focuses on the processes of change. Whereas uh, building scenarios focuses on the outcome of change, and that's the big difference. And this difference is also a difference in anticipation. Diagnosis of the change, you might say, it, facil it facilitates this decision making. It is the system going to, to transform itself? And it does that by taking bearings of the times. So you use diagnosis of the times to guide your action. Whereas sociology, uh, you, when you build uh, scenarios of future society, uh, you facilitate decision making by drawing attention for the need for action. For example, if climate change uh, is what it, it, it uh, appears to be in 40 years, then we have, there's a need now to do something about it. So that's the difference. My overall, my starting point, you might say, my overall diagnosis of the times of what has happened is that we live in a time in which we see an acceleration of the pace of change. This is a common idea, but I, I tried to, to, to diagnose it further. And if you go down, down to it, this is a very old tendency. It actually goes all the way back in human history. And, and um, the first acceleration came about when we introduced a uh, uh, agriculture 10,000 years ago. And this was actually the first time when man became a working animal, a working man. And this is when humans began to plan, because we have to, 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 to plan when to harvest and so on. So the rise of cognitive anticipation occurred probably about 10,000 10, years ago. The next acceleration is the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And what is the key um, uh, importance here is 
that what is emerging is a new kind of historical consciousness. The consciousness that the future might be radically different from the past. And this is why we see a lot of focus on revolution uh, and uh, ideas of history coming to an end and so on. And Kosselik says that, that this happens because there, there is a, a development of a crisis consciousness in these times. And this crisis consciousness is a consciousness that things cannot continue as they were. Things are going to change. And there is this notion of progress, as, uh, as is uh, 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 very uh, dominant in, especially in the 19th century. And we have an appearance of a new kind of man, the entrepreneur, who occurs in uh, uh, historians say um, 1870s of our land. So it's, it's a new way of, of being an industrial person. Now today we talk about a new acceleration of the time of pay, of, 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 of an acceleration of the pace, pay, pace of change. I misspelled it, I can see. And there are different studies that point to this. And the one study is that we will experience a fundamental shift in society, going from industrial society to knowledge society. Uh, Owen talks about this new catastrophism, about climate change and so on. We hear talk about the fourth industrial revolution, the second machine age, which implies that the future of work is uh, changing really fast. Um, Frey and Osborne to, to Oxford, to, to Oxford uh, researchers say that up to half of all jobs, jobs will disappear in 10, in 10 to 20 years. And most radical maybe we have Ray Kurzweil <coughs> talking about singularity, where, uh, where artificial intelligence will be smarter than humans. Uh, and he actually says this is going to happen uh, in, in, in 30 years. I'm not so sure about that, but it, it's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of studies, and, and and my point here is that these studies are not only studies of change, but they create change themselves, and they do so when they become public discourses. And for instance, the knowledge society is a public discourse, and it has effects on us. Um, the the discourse of future work and and digitalization. This idea of, of exponential growth, it, it does something to us. So my point is here that the more we talk about the future changing, the more the, the more the future will actually change because we see that there are new possibilities. So my point is here that anticipation begets anticipation. And I think that this is kind of overlooked in, in all the talk about anticipation. Um, uh, it's not just innocent. We're not just innocent when we're talking about anticipation, we are actually creating change. So, my focus in order to investigate this further is to try and, and, uh, and inquire into the nature of change. And my hypothesis uh, in my research is that only humans can create change. And this is quite important. It, it, it's somehow banal and somehow uh, we we uh, take for granted that technology and, 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 and many other kinds of things can create change. I say no, only humans can create change because change is about changing the way we do things, change the way we think. So it's a matter of how we relate to our practices, our thinking. And this the way we relate, what, what we are looking for when we are, are, are focusing on change is exactly this crisis consciousness as Koselik talks about. Because crisis consciousness is to relate to our practices and ways of thinking, saying this cannot continue. We have to think differently. We have to act differently. One sign of this crisis consciousness is exactly this debate on uh, future employment. And what is interesting is that, that, that you talk about it not as something that is going to develop in, in like say 50 or 100 years. No, it's an imminent crisis. It's going on right now. And uh, there's a public debate uh, about it. 
And uh, this public debate creates change, I say. It opens the eyes to things could be different. Uh, I could drive a driverless car. Uh, I could uh, do big data research uh, when, uh, in my research. And, and this debate is upon disruption, and then they say that many jobs that used to require humans, jobs, uh, complex jobs, uh, complex tasks, um, uh, uh, and so on, they are going uh, to be automated. Uh, also, a lot of these so-called safe white-collar jobs. Um, and this intensifies our crisis consciousness. Uh, is there still a job for me uh, in the future? And what is interesting is that, is then that there are a lot of signs of, of crisis consciousness in, the, in this public debate, but also in the academic discussion too. Uh, what uh, people have been talking about is these late advances in artificial intelligence. Uh, not only have supercomputers beat world champions in chess, but also in Go, uh, they can uh, supercomputers can do uh, generative designs that that generates uh, surprising solutions. They can they can beat experts on intuition. Um, and what they're saying right now is that it seems as though that machine learning, which is this new kind of artificial intelligence, is so effective that practically any task can be automated, provided that we have data. So, if you have data, the machine can learn from it, it can recognize the patterns, and it can do the task. And the discussion right now is, uh, can machines be creative or innovative? And just a few years ago, everybody agreed machines cannot be creative and innovative. And now, people have doubts. These experts have, have doubts. I would say, to, to look into this question, we, we have to ask what are the nature of creativity and, and innovation? And, and this is what my research do. And looking at theories in creativity and innovation, it's, it's very clear that, that creativity and innovation is about combining elements, not within a domain, but between different domains. And this is that creativity and innovation functions and operates beyond domains. And it's only in domains that rules apply and data is available. So when we are creative and innovative, there are no rules to follow. There are no uh, uh, data to guide this process. So my point is that machines actually need humans to not only create change, but also handle change, understand change, and sense change. And this would be my last uh, uh, slide there. This means for future education, that when we are preparing for change, we have to uh, cultivate the capacities that, that is about sensing change. And this is cultivating a crisis consciousness, uh, uh, cultivating young people to be open to change and expect change. This is what anticipation is about. But it's also about understanding change, to anticipate forecast diagnosis, and this is future studies, and it is to handle change. And this is, it is where will and judgment is important. Because when we have no data, when we have no rules, then we only have will and judgment to guide these processes of change. And last, to create change, we need creativity and innovation. And creativity and innovation is a special way of relating to what we are doing. It's, it's to be open for new ideas. And the anticipation model here, which is really important, is certain moves, mo moods. When we are creative and innovative, we are in a mood of disturbance, a mood of enthusiasm, and that is exactly uh, the moods that do that we anticipate that things are different. When we are enthusiastic, we believe, hey, we can do new things. When we are disturbed, it's because what we believe what will the truth is no longer the truth, it seems. So, my last point is, we will see a fundamental shift in focus in education. From skills, which have dominated the last hundred years at least, to a person's way of relating. And this is back to some old educational concepts of wisdom, eaters, 
and build on. And these are capacities that are in fact effective in nature. So that would be my suggestion for future education. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, all right, our last speaker, Sun Yang Li, also going to be talking about education in the future. system of reasoning to use anticipation as a mode of reasoning 
that has governed our present way of thinking, seeing, and acting on in education. I think approaching anticipation as a historical question is important for the education research because I think without teasing out the historical effects of anticipation that have limited our present time, not only provided the possibility but also limited the similar styles of reasoning are continuously re-inscribed in, in the name of new education reform. From this perspective, problematizing the anticipatory system of reasoning is newly to understand how the differences of the humankind are made through the non-linear relation with the future. So let me start from the past. Uh, Wisconsin Child Study Society in 1898 emphasized much of the data concerning the child's emotional nature must be the result of daily observation on the part of parents and teachers. This is one observation chart that teachers use. If you see the observation chart, teachers' observation was not just to see the children. It is to classify, differentiate the students based upon the categories like age, eye, ear, breathing, general nervous conditions, and the mental characteristics. The way how the mental characteristic of children became visible is really interesting because the mental is invisible. But it became visible through the subcategories like how the students are deficient or superior in what subject matter. Or is it happy? Is it bright? Is it a leader or a follower? So through these categories, the mental ability became visible. However, observation was not to make everything visible. Categorical function of observation at that present was closely linked to the anticipated future. If you see another survey from the child study movement, the categorical distinction of the observation of children was to compare the urban children versus rural children. This comparative mode of distinction was made not only teachers' observation, but also by projecting the pastoral image as the utopia future in that period. This was the period of urbanization and industrialization in the U.S. when the young people moved to the urban era, searching for their jobs, and this urbanization created social fears, one on the public health, sex issues, social welfare, religion, immigrant, particularly in the urban environment. So the leaders of the child city movement argued that this urbanized hothouse tends to ripen everything before its time. So they needed to visualize urban kinds of children as different from rural kinds of children. This is the point that I want to make. The pastoral image uh, as a utopic future guided what to make it visible and also invisible through the teacher's observation. And there is a double gesture because the visualization of urban children was to erase their differences from the rural children, but ironically, teachers' observation inscribed the differences which meant to be erased. If we think about teachers' observation, when a teacher observes and names the urban children, this naming process loops into the process of making the urban children as urban children. This is the moment when the urban children are paradoxically excluded to be included. And this exclusively inclusive reasoning happens with the projected future, pastoral image as the utopic future. One thing that I briefly touched in this presentation is the eugenics movement in this period. The leaders of the child study movement were part of the eugenics movement. As you already know, the eugenics movement was to use the biological science for the social implications. And it was based upon the evaluative logic of differentiating the kinds of people in the present in the name of making the better future. This is why I think that it is really important to approach anticipation scholarship as a historical question, which should be visible which has because who became visible and who was not included and what made this visualization possible. Then what about contemporary? Bill Gates, maybe you know Bill Gates. Bill Gates Foundation has supported an educational project which is named in Majors of Effective Teaching. So it aimed at create 
the observation system, which is different from the past. So these are some examples of the reports of this project. So if you see the title, Building Trust in Observations, and also seeing it clearly, and the subtitle is Improving Observer Training for Better Feedback and the Better Teaching. You can notice the observation is attached with more teacher-oriented feedback and the better teaching rather than looking at the children. This is not only this project. So aligned with this project, the state teacher evaluation system nearly adopted like a Wisconsin Teacher Effectiveness System, the name of the new system, which also uses systematized observation as a central technology to develop teachers. And this list is just some example that observation as a system is not, not only at the level of a project, but it is a national trend that happens in the multiple area. Then what does it mean, system of observation? This is one example from Wisconsin Teacher Evaluation Rubrics. In Madison, Wisconsin, they have like 23 indicators. Uh, these are the indicators, they have 23. And each indicator has four categories from ineffective, minimally effective, effective, and highly effective. In this systematized observation, all possible futures of teaching are all inscribed and all anticipated in the 23 indicators. So if you see, this is an example. The, <laughs> so, so, so the knowledge. So knowledge is not every kind of knowledge in this <coughs> systemized observation. <coughs> related to the common core state standards, which is the nationally adopted the states, the K-12 uh, teacher uh, K-12 curriculum content. So uh, the possibility of teaching is pre-inscribed through the practice of observation and therefore determines how the teaching should be. For, from this, I want to point out two aspects. First, the paradoxical reasoning of certainty of observation and the uncertainty of future. On the one hand, future is uncertain and indeterminate because the current knowledge cannot fully predict the exact kind of future. On the other hand, the future is certain and determined in that observation and feedback is given in a way to prescribe what kind of future should be. So what is your problem in the, the current age? So how you should develop in the future to be a highly effective teacher? It is a paradoxical because the uncertainty of the future is managed through the certainty of observation, the certainty in the present, for example, in the form of standardized observation. Secondly, the ensuring of certainty is made through numerical op operations of term from uh, borrowing from Hansen. Uh, if we see how the clarity of observation and result training for observers, teaching is judged as the numerated uh, operations, so like the frequencies, all, almost all, some, or a few. And the sum of, if you see the bottom, the sum of the other scored observation is how the effective kinds of teacher are made. It also has a double gesture of making the difference because making every, making every teacher highly effective as the utopian future creates the unfinished gap between the ineffective teacher and the highly effective teacher. That is, ineffective teacher should be inscribed to be corrected, developed and changed into being the highly effective teacher. So where this fear comes from? So the fear on effective teaching is the precondition of the systematized observation. In other words, as ineffective teaching has potential fears in students' academic success, in their readiness for college and career, which is a central focus of the US K-12 Common Core State Standards. So the ineffectiveness in the present should be observed and measured to be erased. The double gesture of anticipatory system of reasoning is that the youth of the future is every teacher should be highly effective. And in order for this, certain kind of teachers should be continuously exclusively included as an ineffective teacher. So observation system seeks for the reducing the differences among teachers, but this desire creates the unreducible gap between the ineffective teacher in the present, highly effective teacher in the future. To conclude, my presentation tried to approach the anticipation system of reasoning as a historical question. So 
I think I try to move from past to the present and how the idea of anticipation is aligned with the making the visualization, the kinds of teacher. And the anticipation has how it has limited the current ways of thinking or seeing the kinds of people, what kind of children, what kind of teachers we have made through this anticipatory logic. So thank you so much. <laughs> Today's um, presenters loosely called frameworks from dissent, for dissent. Um, provocations through infiltration, collective dreaming, prototyping. And we're actually starting with a provocation, actually, right side to left side of the room. So Andrew's paper, Andrew Morrison's paper, and I'm not going to spend a long time introducing everyone because you've got full details in your programmes and I'm really passionate, uh, voiceless though I am, uh, for having time for discussion and debate. Um, but Andrew started with um, a provocation that his paper um, would, would um, select or offer, I quote, a broader transdisciplinary view on anticipation than that influentially, crucially, influentially proffered by Roberta. So we will start in that mode. Disruptions to follow. What was it? Funny how those first sentences yes. should always yes. be erased. <laughs> thank you for attending and uh, thank you for raising the bar. There was a great uh, television program, isn't there? Robot Wars, Let the Game Begin. <laughs> so, thank you for coming along. Um, I say that with modesty because I uh, acknowledge hugely how hard it is to build a transdisciplinary field that's taken decades to grow. So I'm trying to argue for some humanities and design-infused approaches. Will they be disruptive? We will see. Will they be convergent, perhaps? Uh, you are the audience. Design Baroque Futures. My talk is concerned with exploring the dynamics of Baroque knowledge making. And the context of my work is the Norwegian Arctic and the domain of landscape studies. I view landscape in cultural terms, even in an Anthropocenic epoch, drawing on the landscape practitioner and theorist James Corner's position that design strategies may provide catalytic frameworks for responding to local conditions, ecological specificity, and the emergence of built environments that may disrupt notions of the sublime and the picaresque. Pardon me, <coughs> picturesque. That's a great slip. <laughs> Did anyone notice? <laughs> so. Just checking. <laughs> just checking you're with me. Design. While futures research has expanded over the past three decades, design studies uh, as a key profession and research multidiscipline has also come into its own in the same period, together with a very practice based expertise. And yet these seldom feature explicitly in anticipatory studies covering areas such as foresight, scenario, strategic planning, decision making. Yes, they're there, but they're not researched or articulated as an in or through design. So that's one of the fields that we perhaps have more to bring to this uh, transdisciplinary field. Design is a productive but also a critical pursuit for those who think of it only as design of products or blingy things. It's not only concerned with problem solving, but the querying of givens and the prospective forward-looking pursuit of alternate, possible, potential, and even putative futures. Baroque. The insertion of the term Baroque is a deliberate humanity-centered selection to support and account for the building of anticipatory relations, expressions, and analyses between design and futures. So I'm taking a risk. I'm trying to disrupt my own comfort too. To turn to the Baroque in this way may seem itself excessive or superfluous, but this is the point. The Baroque may be approached as a conceptual, cultural, and design affordance that boasts beyond the historical boundaries of the 17th century culture, where it had a frame-breaking effect in art, architecture, and literature, such as Eglinton says. Often studied in terms of aesthetics, 
The Baroque provides us with means to work beyond the frames of given approaches and assumptions. Richie Glutzmann, in 2013, observes two main embodied aspects. In a historical view, drawing on the myths of Prometheus and Narcissus, a Brock aesthetics was realized allegorically, the word to note down, materialized in relations of form formlessness, attending to the marvelous and extending to furore. In contrast, engaging with the virtual of today for many leads to the figure of Icarus, with the Baroque manifested in a culture of flux. So that's you, that's me, that's us. I suggest along with Katerina Sack, a landscape theorist and a practitioner, that drawing on a neo-Baroque allows, quote, the creation of a design strategy that is purposeful, indeterminate and speculative circumventing any caricature of nature as scenic beauty. So just to help us out, the SDS scholar John Law motivates that we approach the Baroque in his recent writing as a register, less an aesthetic. So this is not an aesthetic argument. He advances six techniques of the Baroque concerned with the messy ways of knowing in social science, to which I will shortly return. Futures, should I say anything more at this point in the conference? How then might we take up these techniques narratively in building relations between design and futures as part of strategies and tactics for shaping designerly and communicative spaces for pitching alternate embodied and prospective futures? Working with design futures in the Arctic is certainly one way to physically and psychologically meet such contexts and challenges. Think of your fingertips. This paper will illustrate this with three completed experimental empirical examples of engaging with the Baroque in design narratives. So that's what I will be up to. I'll just to reassure you, we can see the slides. We're really, the slide. we're really, really sorry. We the, light. the lights we cannot be changed. Apparently the lights are this? controlled by Big Brother. An electrician would be required to alter the lights, mm -hmm. so let us not, we can discuss that in the question time, but nothing mm -hmm. can be done about this. But honestly, Andrew, they're good. And do so interrupt me because I'm quite happy no in the performance interruptions mode. Now because you're already going to go over your 50 minutes if you're not careful. This is a summer's day on a small icebreaker on the way to Barentsburg, the only remaining Russian mine in the Norwegian administered territory of Svalbard. The far north as a pristine landscape, mesmerizing in its beauty, yet rapidly melting, glaciers, ice sheets, water and air, all being rapidly transformed as temperatures rise. The environment around you literally rippled with change as you encountered it. How to communicate the changing nature of the Arctic landscape, of the physical and the immaterial, the numerous specialities and the discursive constructions deployed to try to understand them, in flux, excessively dynamic, the ice literally moving beneath one's conceptual and actual feet. Liquidity, a troubling term in these nano-action financial times, but a key one to consider perhaps. The first case considers, concerns a team of designer researchers in shaping a shared and fluid victory of a nuclear-powered narwhal, a nuclear-powered narwhal, to address key issues to do with moving between timescales, past, present, and future for the Bactinian literary scholars in an unnatural narrative, that's the mode of narrative inquiry we draw on, unpacking cultural landscapes in the context of the Anthropocene. This image is from Taubaum Zentralen, the central coal shuttling point in Longyearby in Svalbard. No longer in use, it's a creaking testament to the history of coal extraction in the industrial lineage of Svalbard. Now a venue for data mining, 30% of all low uh, orbiting satellite data comes from Svalbard. Scientific research and education, and more recently, experience and eco-tourism. The second case concerns the interplay between two studio courses in landscape and urbanism held in Svalbard in 2016. The cases toggle between the factive and the functionary in terms of the taught course and studio in fieldwork mode and the explorations thereof, the fictive and the fabulous, as modes of anticipatory knowing. 
with a self-selecting volunteer design fiction group. The third case refers to an ethnographic narrative design future account, a story told together over time, of moving towards an old hotel, as you see here in Vardo, Norway, a small island off the north coast, uh, to finding new shared collaborative strategies for generating a cultural hub, not a social entrepreneur space, but a cultural site for future cultural growth and change. <coughs> But is everything a story? In each instance, key aspects of a Baroque register are taken up through the application of narrative in design and futures. They might offer us a productive, alternative, discursive performativity that extends into design futures that are promising, if not wholly utopian. These cases function as sites for exploring qualities of the Baroque <coughs> as conceptual, cultural, and communicative resources for teasing out the dynamics, tensions, and potential diversity of anticipation. From a design center view, they allow us to shift into the conjectural and putative, and to turn these back to both actual and projected futures. So, in her preface to The Madness of Vision on Baroque Aesthetics, Wookie Glucksmann observes that two main aspects are, in the Baroque, always seen as embodied. Historically, the Baroque aesthetics work allegorically, moving between relations of form and formlessness, attending to the marvelous. And in contrast, we say that we have flux. Is everything a story that is flux? What work might our narratives do with and for whom? How might design fiction and fictive designing inform our future imaginaries? What might a future humanities entailing the historical and the digital offer and proffer, or how to tell a story at minus 10 degrees. Future North is the project within which this uh, approach has taken place. It is a, a truly interdisciplinary project <laughs> built with a team of landscape architects, media colleagues, my colleague Henry Menzer, a social scientist, has been part of this project, an ancillary member looking at the conditions, contexts, and cultures, uh, and the territories and terrains, trying to work between information, perception, and practice, bringing experience and interpretation together. But for us, the Baroque is a frame-breaking activity. It has an effect. It's a mode of theater. It has the aesthetic that looks at point of view, such as we know from uh, aesthetics and particular studies, uh, such as anamorphosis, or if you like, point of view, changing and playing with the image, perspectival illusionism, illusionism as we know from Velasquez's paintings, for example. It uses techniques such as juxtapositioning of like and unlike to bring us into relationships of perceiving and problematizing. And it works with a kind of abundance, an excess, uh, some people even call a voluptuousness. So, this is something that is quite difficult to consider when one is cold, you might think. Have a think on it. Imagine how cold you would be to think this way in the Arctic. But then there is the Neo-Baroque, the Baroque that in a sense has moved from the Portuguese pearl, the shining, rough, diffracting uh, exterior, to a Neo-Baroque taken up by scholars in Latin America, who in particular have tried to work out a kind of counter-conquest discourse to be turning the Baroque on and into itself, looking at it as a cultural strategy. And as uh, Salgado has done, uh, this is very much about challenging modernist knowns, nodes and modes of representation. It is, as my uh, colleague uh, I refer to from Landscape, uh, Kat Catalina Such, says it's a design potential, a cultural strategy, for, in her uh, logics, a restoration of urban ecosystems in Perth, in Western Australia, in the desert, the only other literature I've come across. But for us, in our project, design is seen as a cultural strategy um, that is there for the exploration of design anticipatory futures, design in a Baroque sense. In each of these, I give you references to papers that you can follow up and see, and I'm happy to make them available. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, if I take a very quick look, the work of John Law and colleagues has taken up theatricality, boundlessness, heterogeneity, folding, distribution, movement, and mediation as key features 
in a new conceptualization of the Baroque as a kind of mode of knowing. So case one has Narata, a nuclear-powered narwhal. She is a device drawn up by eight design researchers to communicate their own switch between time and place and space coming up through the water, able to fly because she has this uh, forced hybrid bill made by two crazy scientists one night. There's a whole blog post, life, backstory, you can meet Narata. She's a member of our team, as you can see. Uh, she is a bio-enhanced nuclear-assisted narwhal, and she is one of the members of our team who observes us and comments reflexively on our own behaviors. So our design fictive imagining also appears around us in the harbors, for example, of the town Bardo. She talks about the nature of nuclear power in the Arctic and her own construction in a Donna haraway sense. But she is speaking. She is ironizing. She is the pastiche artifact herself. But it is done between us. We write about Cod is Great, uh, a public art project uh, in a town by reflecting on it as members of a research community coming together in context. We travel in the ice, on ships, into the landscape that we do not know that we have to encounter. She is an endangered species. She is a fictive voice, but she is a refractive voice. The second case is from Svalbard. Longyearbyen is the capital, the town, 2,000 to 4,000 inhabitants, depending upon the season. This is a case working as a parapedagogy, a course alongside a course with volunteer students who've already done the landscape urbanism course in the town on site, doing the factual, the functional, the meaningful for today and the near future, into an imaginary with 12 students who produced a design fictive work about living in Svartvog in 2050. What kind of world is it, world is it with new maps like Audrey Tatus? A splice between Mary Shelley's own work on Svartvog and imaginary beings, human hybrids, in which our relationships to the animal, mammal, ourselves may be changed. In which one student has seen a new nation, a century old scheme, where Norway has occupied Svalbard in its own strategic internationalism, where the minds of the town have been repurposed through new lights, the new sky lighting, which is an Italian current real invention, fantastic blue daylight, where the minds become new chambers of living and being. And where eventually in the narrative, a strange cloud comes out over the town and makes apparent a structure, an architectural build, which when you read the story you eventually discover is the blueprint for the global seed bank. In the future, nobody knows it's there. This is how they discover it. It comes out into being in a data world. They then discover how to put the seeds into the earth. In the global seed bank, as my colleague Einar Martinussen and others have shown, very little of the data actually is terribly secure or, in one sense, richly constructed. We have such valuable resources. How are we to grow things in the future when we cannot find our past in the future? So this is an actual mirror image, a virtual seed bank, if you will, of the future. Case three to close is Vardo Hub. Work in progress that has been slightly delayed, where I will be the weekend after next, working with the Boteusen family and Project Vardo Restored, which has been restoring wooden buildings <coughs> in the town. The old hotel is one of those, now owned by one family, once occupied by the Nazis. It has had a nightclub in its cellar. This is how it looks. There is data online you can find. Here is the small town to which we go. Not so strange or far away, until it's minus 10 in a blizzard. And the last time I visited with Sandra, children were not allowed outside because the winds were so high they would be blown away. <laughs> Completely different place within one year, within one month. The hotel that is now owned by a family who wished to make a community cultural construct, a civic site for engaged futures, one in which the building has been restored, but the interior remains to be structured and built. An Airbnb becomes a make b, &B in shorthand terms, 
where visits and advice from designers and architects revisiting have pulled together the sketch of the past and the images of the future into possible spaces of discussion for craftsmen such as Rasmus working with us, looking at resources from other online uh, places such as Central in Central Oslo or Impact Hub Bergen, these sorts of centres of our times, places, hot desking, visiting, civic exchanges, built and framed in Norway under social entrepreneur business programmes that allow the design baroque to be thought of in a complex, multiple way, so that the creation of design strategies may be read as purposeful, translationable, actionable, and diverse, that they straddle, as Katharina Sack says, the intellectual and the physical, in the forms of delight and play, meravaglia, I think is the Italian, to invest landscape in a sense with, a sen with wonder that the design has a reflexive future frame account that takes us to other kinds of constructions, to Pyramiden outside uh, Longyearbyen. This is a mural in the abandoned wood town, mine town, Pyramiden of a glacier on a wall, public Soviet art, so that we are in ourselves already embedded in the future in these environments that have references. to do to our key to come for this, our key questions over here. I think that lovely um, phrase, Andrew, you had about the Arctic as an environment constantly rippled with change. But not just uh, temporality, but the narratives underpinning temporality have returned again and again um, throughout the conference. And the earlier um, one of the earlier sessions today that I know some of you were in um, thinking about what Andrew called fictive and fabulous um, forms of anticipatory knowing or embodiment of anticipation. So I think these are all wonderful uh, light motifs that are returning again and again. Um, we now turn to Isabella, and um, Isabella is going to, Isabella's title is the New York Subcommittee of Temporary Operations and Public Dissent. And again, we're continuing on the theme of disruption. Okay. Hello, good morning. So I'm Isabella, and I'll present the New York City Subcommittee of Temporary Operations and Public Dissent, which is within this larger investigation of infiltration and opening through design. And just to give you some background, I'm currently working for MindLab, which is a government innovation unit in Denmark, but I'm working as a consultant, uh, consultant in Brazil. And in parallel to that, I'm also teaching a class in the University of Brasilia called Para Design, which is a mix of physics as a topic and speculative design as an approach. And what I'm going to talk today about is a project I did during a master's in transdisciplinary design at Parsons, the new school in New York City. So the project is a narrative, and I'm using design as a stimulus for imagination around a very solid institution and to offer a framework for dissent. And this is a story with missing chapters and different entry points. So I'm trying to offer some kind of rhizomatic network rather than having all this story concentrated in one single point. And I would like to begin with one of these entry points, which is a video. Let's see. This is New York City. Latitude 40 north, longitude minus 74 west, eastern coast, United States. Organized in six boroughs, 
the city is the most complex in the country. The mayor's office is the authority responsible for New York City's government. The government is a system by which a society is controlled. It is designed to mitigate uncertainty and provide safety, stability, consent, and stamps. Stamps are official marks that indicate validation and order. The mayor's office is composed of several offices and departments, such as the Community Affairs Unit. The Community Affairs Unit has the mission to actively engage residents throughout the six boroughs, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and Interstices. Interstices is the sixth borough <coughs> made of all the spaces in between, not addressed by other borough directors. It is administered by the Subcommittee of Temporary Operations and Public Dissent, also known as STOPT, an agency that exists non-existently. STOPT's members operate across all city agencies by filling in for absent employees. Their internal meetings are in the hallways only, and they use the elevator for pitching ideas to other city agencies. Stop practices and advocates for infiltration, a method of active appropriation and opening in the urban space, using constraints as opportunities. They have been involved in actions and programs that range from the overtly subversive to the quietly inquisitive, such as urban ocularities to observe absences, unprecedented living stations, and infrastructural interactions. Their projects are prefigurative experiences and therefore are not meant to last. However, the possibilities and ideas opened are permanent through site-specific and geo-referenced public archives throughout the city. The digital files replaced Stop's traditional practice of planting ideas in the cracks of asphalt. This non-traditional gardening ritual actually gave them expertise to lead a training program on how to grow bees in acidic urban soil in between buildings. The harvesting grew in scale and mobilization. However, the community's goals of territorial permanence conflicted with Stop's operational standards. It is important to remember that projects which become too established and large in scale will lose their affiliation with Stop. Residents can get in touch with the Subcommittee of Temporary Operations and Public Dissent through mailboxes identified with their local. They have been consistently found in street blocks, where there is a school, a church, and a bodega. Thank you for your attention. So the project is the narrative of this subcommittee, so this agency that exists non-existently, that I'm calling also a pataphysical agency because it deals with imaginary solutions, it governs laws of exceptions, and it also questions the absurdity of existence. And it is deliberately slippery, so living somewhere in between reality and fiction. And here's their logo, out here, manifesting the streets. And STOP's mission is to challenge and open given processes and structures, allowing city residents to imagine new forms of life and interactions even with the urban space. Their ultimate goal is to build capacity for self-organizing and dissent, promoting conditions for distributed agency, imagination, alternative forms of governance, and a more just society to emerge. <coughs> Their values are prefiguration, in the sense that everything they do is temporary and some kind of rehearsal of futures. Play, they use the given rules to find an opportunity to make a tactical move. Experimentation, so they practice active imagination, putting into practice ideas or fragments of ideas. And appropriation, they use what's already there as opportunities for creative acts. And STOP is a curatorial lab, so it not only practices experiments and develop programs, but it also stores all the ideas in public archives throughout the city. 
And um, the activities are detailed in this report of selected operations, which describes not only what has been done, the effects, and also some of the evidences that those activities have occurred. And my strategy to create this body of work for stopped was threefold. So first, I did some experiments myself in the city and with collaborators, and small, small interventions. But I also appropriated some events that happened, that actually happened in history, and events that somehow shared values with stopped, so that I could create some sort of pretended legitimacy or credibility to this organization. And I also use public imagery and then adapted to Stott's uh, visual identity. And one of the biggest challenges I had was on how to evaluate the project, since it is a conceptual project. So I decided to take it on a more qualitative path and engage in conversations with people directly related to the context. So civil servants in the mayor's <coughs> office. And then I took this um, entry point, so the video and the report of operations, and talked to them especially about implications and controversies they saw in relation to their actual work. And right after the first conversation, I realized that one measure of success for the project was the question, not if people believe if this is a real thing, but if people were able to imagine what would happen if this was real. So using Genevieve's words from the Office of Operations, mm -hmm. you take this solid institution that is the mayor's office and apply this new layer, making us question if it's real, or rather imagining what would happen if it was real. And again, Genevieve, um, in regards to the constraints of her work and how she faces those, Sometimes you come across a constraint that is so powerful that it actually precludes you from being able to implement a solution from within the system, something that would actually be beneficial. But stop is a loop that goes outside government, is filtered through the actual stuff of the world, gains much more momentum, and then comes back to the government. And this could also be a commentary on some kinds of innovation units inside the government. Sometimes you can become too trapped, or they become too instrumental in their actions. And then Carlos from the Department of Parks, um, talking about the intrinsic tension of having this unit that has descent as reason of being inside this larger structure that is created to provide consent. So the word descent is a red flag in the government because it means challenging the status quo, and people here are afraid to change. So the idea of soft is both a desired and a feared idea. And finally, in regards to the temporality, uh, Jorge from the Office of Appointments said, soft operates somewhere in between government and community, and its biggest value comes from being ephemeral. So since it, this is an imagination exercise but related to a very concrete moment of reality, I'm calling it a situated fiction. But for it to move forward, though, it needs to remain permanently related. So it cannot become too real or it would lose its criticality. And it could also not move to the fantasy side or it would lose its grounds. So it needs to remain at this kind of uprising inside this very controlled and controlling power structure. So some kind of Trojan horse or event. And Badio puts in a very nice way this idea of political event. Um, and he says, the power in place doesn't ask us to be convinced that it does everything very well, but to be convinced that it's the only thing possible. With a political event, a possibility emerged that escaped the prevailing power's control over possibles. And I'm using this narrative of the subcommittee as an embodiment of a proposition of infiltration, which is a method of appropriation and opening in the urban space using what's already there. And taking a step back, I'm understanding design here not as trying to find a singular solution to a problem, 
but rather as an opening process, a process that tries to keep open the open, which is our human ability to question the ordinary, but also referring to the conference questions, to how to keep the future open, and how to allow this eventual everyday to take place, which are the possibilities that already exist within the actual everyday taking eventu eventual, not only as an event, but also eventual, which is the possible. And finally, in a world that we're still dominated and our mental models are still dominated by modern, modernist principles of hierarchy, order, determinacy, and um, hierarchy, I'm trying to offer this alternative of practice that is quite physical, quiet, and perhaps feminine. Thank you. So we also, we also saw Sandra leave, um, and she anticipated very well that she has been a well herself, uh, so she asked me to be here just in case uh, there needed to be an extra chair. So we'll wait for her just in case, but also in the meantime we carry on with, with the session if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Sure. So our third speaker is um, I'm Carlos Lopez Galvez, and I'm, I'm a colleague of, of uh, Sandra's at uh, Lancaster University. Um, the third speaker, uh, we have uh, Katerina and Theodor. 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 Uh, Katerina Theodor. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a nice <laughs> from the Open University, and we're going to be listening to uh, their presentation on design, anticipation, creative futures through collective training. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of wonderful connections to the two presentations we've had so far. So, what you so I'll start um, with the presentation. Um, we're both um, senior lecturers in design at the Open University, and yes, our presentation is about design anticipation. Um, First, we're going to introduce some key concepts to help understand how we see the relation between design and anticipation. Um, and then we're going to focus specifically on collective design anticipation and discuss the barriers and opportunities, that, um, the uh, conditions that make social groups capable to design. Um, and this builds on some previous research we have done on um, the conditions that enable design um, neurological level, cognitive level, some mathematical studies as well, but here the focus is on the social. And we will end with some reflections on disruptions to connect to the theme of the session. Um, so the relation between design and anticipation, at the first level both design and anticipation involve a relation between present and future, actual and potential. Um, Anticipation, there's a number of different definitions. Here's two from Robert Rosen and Daniel Dubois. Um, it's fair to say what's in common in viewing anticipation is seeing it as a capacity to act in response to or in preparation for um, a potential future. So, this inversion in time where the future um, influencing influences the present. And this resonates with design. Um, these are two definitions of design which are pretty common um, as um, devising courses of action to uh, change existing situations into preferred ones or conceiving a product that would uh, really like for a particular purpose. So, again, um, the common view of design is as a capacity to conceive a thing. Uh, that would turn the potential into actual. And when we say thing, this can be an object, but it can also be an action, a process, a strategy, a policy. Um, so, design anticipation is a special type of anticipation which is not simply about, not only about responding to a perceived uh, future state, but it's about conceiving that future state together with a thing that we realize it. And um, in design literature, this is often discussed as a paradox that um, design involves arriving uh, to a solution to a problem that is not defined in advance. So the problem uh, is constructed by the very process. 
these are some references. So we want to unpick this a little bit more, design the discussion a bit more, and we propose to do this by looking at two dimensions. The first is dreaming, and it's the capacity to explore and imagine pathways that connect the actual to the potential. Um, so usually design starts with these questions about what the future could be that would make our present better, and what exists in the present that um, limits or can help achieve a better future. Um, the second dimension is what we call instantiating, and it's the ability to construct theories, abstract principles, concepts, or ideas of things, as well as models, so concrete specifications of those things. Um, so, what are our principles and values, and what kinds of specific things can satisfy those? So, if you put these two together, you have this design anticipatory space. Um, so, design happens at the intersection of the dreaming and the prototyping, and it's the capacity to develop constructs, whether these are usually um, visual, but also physical stories that embody instances of dreams. Um, and when we say about constructs, this, this movement is very um, non-linear and constructs can be um, things that help visualize, um, represent, elicit um, theories and models about the actual reality, or they can be more about visioning and actually prototyping things that could um, realize potential reality. So design progresses in this space in anticipation of a congruence between theories and models. So when um, the abstract and the concrete come together and you actually have um, a thing that brings the future into the present. Um, so, um, design is concerned with two key anticipatory problems or um, ideas, the circularity of time, the idea that the future influences the present and the present influences the future, and circularity of our structure, um, the idea that theories generate models, specifications of reality, and those specifications um, realize or satisfy the theories. And so in theory to talk about collective design and participation in specific. Yes, basically I will continue this theoretical uh, framework and I will try to present some more empirical uh, insights regarding the barriers and conditions for collective design and participation. And these insights are drawn by a number of uh, collaborative research projects uh, that involve um, more than 60 local communities, mainly in UK, but some in broad in Japan, uh, that were dealing with a variety of issues, local issues. Uh, most of them it was issues around social innovation and place making. Some of them was more about democratization of how we regenerate specific urban areas. Uh, but in all these cases, I'm not going to do details about this particular project, but in all these cases we try to understand why, what was the barriers for design anticipation for the people that engage in this process, and what was the mechanism and conditions that helped them get involved in design anticipatory uh, processes. And I have to, that's a quick note, uh, methodological note, that we are talking about conditions uh, and barriers that are developed in the wild with communities. So they are plausible conditions, plausible tools. They're not universal tools of design anticipation that you actually might find in certain of our previous papers uh, that are necessary and sufficient conditions for any design anticipatory uh, condition. Uh, and also there are conditions that are referred to the social environment and materials of people working with this uh, environment, um, within this environment. So the first condition is actually the actual formation of design and participatory space that Katerina theoretically uh, presented. And one of the key observations there and key barriers with all these 60 projects was that the people and communities 
they're often situated within environment, social environment, where there is some form of disconnection between what we call dreaming, this reflection about the past and the, and, and the present and the connection between them, right? and the, the process of instantiation, moving from abstract to concrete and vice versa. And these disconnections is usually, the, re the reason of this connection was because they were, uh, the dreaming is usually happening in a private sphere, in a private conversation within cities, while the instantiation is happening in the professional domain. So in the office of professionals. So usually these two dimensions are critically disconnected. And, and also, the, that's exaggerated because, especially in the UK, whereas there are funds and initiatives, political initiatives initiative that stimulate dreaming in local areas and instantiations, they're still disconnected. They're not trying to build capacity on how the, you connect these two dimensions. So what we try, what we try to do one of the solutions we're trying to do is to create urban spaces where design and dissertation can happen, where people have the opportunity to engage in dreaming and instantiation and not dreams. And that is one example. There are many of that sort. Some of these are not physical spaces, some of these are, but in this particular is a physical space uh, where we work with a local church in East London. Uh, it's a multi ethnic uh, environment. And we organize, we, tr we try to organize it as an open public space that engages local citizens into dreaming and instantiation and prototyping. Uh, so we organize the church in three core zones. In the first zones uh, uh, here, people getting into the church and there is an opportunity to listen to uh, uh, dreams that are recorded by others, but also to record your own dreams. So there is. Uh, an installation of dreams that you can listen and record. You can you could create postcards and other tools to send dreams to others and receive dreams from others. There was a second uh, uh, zone that was more about connecting these dreams and uh, creating some installation with, with that connects dreams that you find in this church. And then a third one where it was a, a zone where there are materials and some like cooking recipes on how you can cook and prototype a dream that you have to start building. Uh, so that's what a kind of example of a design of this particular space that we were trying to create uh, in order to engage people with design anticipation. Now, the second condition was related to the formation of <coughs> material and processes, basically, that would facilitate the movement across the two axes. And, and that's the reason is because we found that one of the key barriers in all of this project is, was that individuals and groups, as a group conversation, found it extremely difficult to connect <laughs> this question between what could be the future with a question of what do we have now that compromise or create our future. They could do the two tasks, they could create future images and they could contemplate the present, but the connection was always difficult to happen. Uh, and also, they were tended to stay in one level of abstraction. Uh, local citizens do, in this conversation, usually will take either the abstract level of principles or the very specific what we need to do to solve our problem. They will never do this travel between the, uh, uh, the dimensions. So a lot of this was about envisaging uh, processes and materials that could have in this particular space that facilitate the movement between past, present, and abstract and concrete. Uh, and yet, this is two examples. It's a very brief conversation. Uh, there are many, but one example was where we could develop with the community a asset mapping uh, process. That's how it's, it's called, where uh, the community could visualize, at least could visualize the assets. We, uh, within a table in such a way that it's and assets meaning the skills of the communities, the resources that they have, a space that they have, but they visualize it in a way that they help us think what is the potential future given these assets or what's the gaps that we need to uh, address. And, and then another uh, completely different approach where it was um, basically a suitcase with materials uh, put it in a public space that encourages people to start uh, dreaming and creating little utopias about their locality. And then use these little utopias, which were small uh, boxes, uh, in order to reflect about challenges or things that they like or that they dislike or what's the meaning of current situation. So again, a link between past and present. 
Uh, and the third condition was the formation of transition between constructs, between the group, moving around the space. Um, and one of the key barriers were, was that we observed in this project is that the individuals and communities, they had a difficulty to, uh, to perceive and move around this space and, and the navigation in this space. So I'll give you an example. We started a project and someone quoted, before we tried to support them, that uh, this community project, they feel like we are in a dark room. So we are doing something and with our hands and then we don't know where to go next because we are in a, in a, in a very dark room. And, uh, and we are many people in this room and they're going in different directions because they have different type of strategy of thinking. And so that was, that's a very key problem, a big problem, which we, I don't think we have managed to address it properly, but one of the uh, uh, things that we're trying to do uh, and with all this project was to develop certain general infrastructures within people are situated in programs, uh, I'll give you some examples later on, uh, that allow people to develop an awareness about this dark room, an awareness about that you are in a dark room and awareness that many people are out there, they have different relationships with you. And that awareness and meta knowledge of this space seems to be critical at the moment. Although this is our weakest point, I would, I would admit, in you know, all these projects. So one of the things that we try to do, it's the obvious thing, we have tried some other uh, solutions, is to create basically training learning spaces like the design, for designers and design studio space where uh, people just you bring local citizens and explore notions of design so it feels like a training, learning, but also explore power relationships between uh, uh, themselves. So what is the relationship to work with a vicar in this particular case and, uh, and some layman. And it is a space where everyone basically it comes as a learner and uh, it's learned through observations and conversations with others. So we do a lot of this experimentation about learning environments. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, that, uh, what we try to say in this presentation is that design is linked to anticipation in two key ways. is traveling in time, yes, but also traveling in abstraction, towards this anticipation of the congruence between theories, abstracts, principles, and models. That's crucial in design. Uh, and, and when we're talking about collective anticipation, essentially, if I try to connect it with the theme of destruction, if you notice in this presentation, we've, we've talked about some small dis disrupt dis disruptions. Disruption between the public and the private distinction. Uh, and disruption between the difference between expert and non-expert designer. Because these disruptions between these two areas might help the formation of what we call designer dissipatory space, given the analysis that we were discussing before. And also disruption sometimes of the power relationships that they exist within and across groups, because that might facilitate the transitions that are happening in this uh, design and dispatch space. And with that, I would like to finish the presentation, just to say thank you and acknowledge ASSC, our City Humanities Research Council, that funded much of this research. And uh, have a good day. Frank, hi. Thank you all for coming, for surviving this far into the conference and uh, gracing us with your presence. Um, my name is Roy Bender, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Industrial Design at Delft University of Technology. My background is in media studies, philosophy of technology, critical theory. I am not a designer. I have to say that when I often talk to people because I do teach in a design department. Um, I'm here to discuss a series of designerly visions for a future Rotterdam. And what I mean by designerly visions are visions created by designers, mostly professional designers, but meant for public consumption. Okay, this is key here. Now, <coughs> yes. These uh, future visions were commissioned by the new institute in Rotterdam. Uh, they were created by a variety of local designers, architects, uh, community organizations, city planners. And in response to Rotterdam's new grant, uh, vision, which is called Wun VZ 2030, so a living vision for the year 2030. The plan included all kinds of uh, really interesting positive aspects, like uh, increasing green spaces in, the, in Rotterdam, um, pushing for more energy efficient housing, things like that. But what really caught the public eye and what ended up being fairly contentious 
was a proposal to demolish 20,000 low-income units, uh, housing units, and replace them with 36,000 mid- and high-income units. Uh, so this is the city, and this is an important reason that these changes were in line with expert predictions about population growth in the city, and also that they were meant to correct market inefficiencies. Interesting. <laughs> so there was some public outrage around the plan. Uh, uh, many, uh, many people thought that there was part of uh, you know, another step in the systemic gentrification of the city. Those who know Rotterdam know that this is a, an ongoing discussion uh, in the city. And eventually the city was forced to conduct a referendum um, which was non-binding to begin with. Uh, but what happened eventually is that only 85,000 people came to vote. That was roughly 17% of eligible voters when 30% was needed for the referendum to have any kind of meaning. So the city took this as a, essentially as a license to go ahead with the plan, uh, you know, but all hurdles uh, cleared. So, in the weeks uh, leading up to the referendum, the new institute decided to intervene and commissioned these visions. Fourteen were commissioned, only twelve eventually came through. Uh, each designer was given a theme, but otherwise the instructions were, were fairly flexible. So, they were in relation to, to Wun, Wun Visi, but they didn't have to uh, refer to it uh, explicitly. And then every designer or designer, and I, I mean your design in a fairly expanded way, so every designer, architect, etc., uh, produced uh, one vision and an uh, uh, accompanying text, and I'll be talking about both of them. So as you can see, themes included things like mobility, resilience, innovation, energy transition, inclusivity, and the results, again, as you can see, are fairly varied. Some of, some of the visions really limit on a particular technological lever, or on a, a particular form of the built environment, and others are way more encompassive, more uh, 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 comprehensive and inspiring, and I will be talking about those ones, because I think they are way more interesting. Uh, so the 12 selected visions uh, ended up on uh, billboards on the street in two very central locations in Rotterdam, outside the, the central station and just in front of the uh, city hall, and were seen by thousands over three uh, three week periods. So these are high uh, walking areas. So in my presentation today, I'm going to treat these designerly visions as traces of what Sheila Jasanoff calls the socio-technical imaginary. Socio-technical imaginaries. She says. These are collectively held, institutionally stabilized, and publicly performed visions of desirable futures, animated by shared understandings of forms of social life and social order attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology. And really the key here is at the back end of the definition. This is really about how ideas from science and technology make their way into other areas, other domains of life, how they shape the way that we think about the world and being in general. Now, the term seems, I think, particularly apt when we're engaging with designerly futures, um, which I, I believe represent a kind of a mid-level futuring. Th these are not the kind of top-down images, future visions that are used by, uh, by city planners, right? That eventually turn into, into policy or into zoning. Hi. Uh, neither are they uh, a kind of a grassroots visioning that comes from, from the, the public at large, which uh, you know might be identified as something more like the social imaginary, more general, which is Charles Taylor's term. So in this sense, I think that they are quasi-public. Uh, they're mostly free from the... Are you done? <laughs> so in this sense, they're mostly free from the political constraints that city planners work with, but they are not free from the kind of professional expertise uh, <coughs> standards, the assumptions, the imperatives of professionals. So they're quite unique. They're somewhere in between. Uh, they are largely a product of experts, of the elite designer class, and we should not lose sight of that. So as I will discuss shortly, these um, 12 designer visions communicate an essential tension in Rotterdam's urban planning. On the one hand, we have this drive for efficiency, for a, um, you know, part of the city's renowned pragmatic, no-nonsense attitude. The Dutch says, while Amsterdam dreams, Rotterdam works. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We've been practicing to be Many times. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, you got it. <laughs> On the other hand, this tension represents uh, the city's desire to really restore uh, some kind of semblance of its cultural heritage and its identity, to promote a sense of community, of livability, of well-being, um, to really become a world-class city, not just the largest port in Europe, but a significant city on the global scene. Now, to get a better sense of this tension, I want to take you back in time, in my little time machine, uh, to what is largely considered the ground zero, or the primal scene 
of Rotterdam's urban design. So in May 1940, after several days of heavy fighting around the city, the German Luftwaffe bombed the city center, uh, killing nearly a thousand people, living, uh, leaving roughly 13% of the city's inhabitants homeless. Now the city's historical center, the inner harbor, uh, were completely destroyed, destroyed about a handful of buildings survived. A day later, after the Nazis threatened to do the same to Utrecht, the Dutch capitulated. Now, the bombing, however, and this is important, was only the first of what has become to known uh, by historians as the double destruction. So, city planners in post-war Europe took advantage of the large destruction, uh, essentially to rebuild old cities according to the planning principles uh, of the time, right? And we're talking about post-war, late 40s, early 50s. And Rotterdam was no different in this sense. Uh, as the story goes, the, chief's, uh, the, the city's chief planner, uh, a major protagonist in the story, Willem Gerrit Witteveen, stood in the backyard of his villa in the upscale neighborhood of Kralling, literally rubbing his hand and licking his chops over the possibility to finally redesign the city center as he wished. And he was not alone. There was a wide consensus among the city's elite that the rapid industrialization that the city experienced in the 19th century left the, the inner city, uh, city center really in a terrible condition. So, within four days after the bombing, the city already commissioned Vitavin for, uh, to, to create a new plan, and uh, as you may imagine, he was well prepared. The plan was already in the drawer. Uh, whatever remained of the city center uh, was entirely removed. So foundations, water, sewage, electricity, even the street, uh, the street plan was erased. And effectively, Rotterdam Center was turned into a sandbox for urban designers. Now, during the drafting of the plan, significant tensions became apparent between uh, those who wanted to restore the city again to what they perceived was its cultural heydays in the 17th and 18th century and those who wanted to build an ultra-modern city after the American model. Now, the tension was palpable in the plan that was eventually adopted in 46. Uh, so the earlier, or the first plan that Vitevin worked on uh, so, so hard, uh, sought a, a kind of a harmonious, aestheticized city look and feel. Uh, but the plan that was adopted, this one, the Bassist plan, said nothing about aesthetics. So Vitevin's plan was a 3D plan. He had a team of architects that did uh, architectural perspective drawings for every single facade of the redone city. Uh, it was huge. Uh, later when they found the archives, they called it the paper city. It was an entire uh, city redone on paper. But the plan that came to be was only a 2D plan. It was what we would see today as kind of a, 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 you know, a zoning plan with no aesthetic vision. And what it did, uh, the basis plan that was adopted, was really all about efficiency, about modularity, and about minimum requirements. It used scientific research, again, to project future power ownership, future power traffic, um, in order to refashion the city's grid and build a set of breezy, open boulevards and parkways uh, like no other city in the Netherlands. Rotterdam, in this sense, is very different from other towns. The plan, as its detractor argued, bowed to the model called traffic. What we know now, however, through historical research, is that the city's business elite resisted the earlier plan and pushed for the plan that was actually adopted. Now, they were worried about too many development restrictions, too much red tape, too many constraints, and uh, they wanted to maintain their capacity to remake the city as they wished. Now, this is a continuing or a long-standing tradition in Rotterdam, that most of city develop development was done by individuals, by rich, affluent individuals, and was rarely done with, uh, you know, with any kind of regard to the public good. That's part of the reason why the city center in the 19th century became so unlivable. So, three months after the plan was introduced and with only token public consultation, it was approved. Everybody got to work. Now, the rich may have gotten away with it, but the tension here between building this kind of efficient city and creating a livable or harmonious space remained very much alive in Rotterdam's urban development later, uh, and it still is today. So, fun part. Let's take a look at some of these, uh, these visions. So this is from a very large uh, architectural firm in Rotterdam called MVRD. They, are, uh, they, they do projects uh, around the world right now. They're very much in demand. Now, the key to this plan, which uh, is around, uh, focuses around this densification, is that flying cars now allow the city to densify. So this is what the text says. It says, in the coming decades, the city will change drastically. A new type of metropolis will develop without roads and without traffic lights. 
People park in the sky! Exclamation mark. The city is finally becoming 3D! Exclamation mark. Well, of course, this is not the 3D of Beethoven, right? Different kind of dimensionality. The city is detached from the ground. Now, I ask you, what is local specific about this? What makes this a vision of Rotterdam and not any other city in Europe or, to that matter, in the world? Uh, the river is somewhat recognizable and the Erasmus Bridge smack in the middle of the image, but um, that's really about it. This is an entirely new city. Compare that to this vision by Max von Architects and Urbanists, and here, again, flying cars are key to this, to this uh, particular vision. Uh, there's lots of drones as well. Now here, the, the flying cars, as the statement go, uh, says, they break the city's love affair with cars. They create a situation where, uh, as the text that accompanies the vision states, the inhabitants of the city began to live on the streets again. Now, the most interesting uh, element in this, in this image, and again, if, you, if you're not from Rotterdam, it's, it's hard to see, but uh, they restored here the zoo that used to be in post-war Rotterdam, right in the middle of the city, and was later moved outside of the center, and they relocated right next to the train station. So this area today is uh, mostly car traffic. There's a big boulevard, and, and it's all uh, you know, the traffic circles and you know, the big avenues. So, while the previous image, quick look, Skycar City, presents what Cordula Roentike calls a progressist position, one in which the city rejects romantic notions of the past and adopts this kind of new identity, this image is a lot more aligned with what she calls a culturalist position, where development is inspired by local heritage. Now, we can get uh, a different perspective on this tension in the next two visions. This is The Abundant City by Felix Landscape Architects and Planners. Now, the key to this, uh, to this vision is that gains in energy efficiency um, allow the creation here of the, in the Kraling Lake of this phantasmagoric <coughs> pleasure dome. Note there's a combination of snowy and tropical landscapes. There's ski lifts and flamingos. And uh, in case you were wondering whether this is uh, feasible or not, well, the top left corner has a graph and it tells us that energy efficiency is coming and this is possible. <laughs> right? uh, but interesting here is that this, these, uh, this efficiency, here, efficiency here drives livability. Right? So the tension is, to some extent is mitigated in, in a very particular way. Compared to this, this is the, the last vision I will show today. Um, but it's called Hyperrealism by the gaming company Enron. Now, on the surface, this looks like, a, like a really like an inspireful, inspiring, playful vision of the city as a playground for the imagination. But take a look at all those screens and what they have on them. They almost exclusively convey information meant to increase efficiency. This is weather reports, train schedules, appointments. <coughs> the city has not turned into a playground. It turned into an office. Now this vision is, I find it to be even more unsettling when we consider the text that accompanied it. So they say, and much, in the digital city of 2030, the physical and virtual reality fused to a fantastic hyperrealism. This has been a theme that's been revisited in previous uh, 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 discussions as well. What happens to humans? Right? It's physical, virtual, but flesh, what's, what's with that? Anyway, the city gives space to the imagination. It is no longer bound to the laws of time and physics and can take all forms. The city tailored for each individual. Now, this is, I find this startling. So having the capacity here to kind of customize our urban experience individually, as Martin de Val uh, from uh, Amsterdam uh, says it's a, it's a signif signifier of a libertarian or a neoliberal citizenship, right? Instead of a platform for sociality, for mutual responsibility, for so solidarity, for, you know, rubbing shoulders on the street, uh, we have here a city as a container for this kind of individualized, fragmented consumption. Really. Neoliberalism promotes consumption, not citizenship. We all know this. Questions about values masquerade as questions about certainty. Ambiguity is replaced by facticity. So, as I briefly discussed before, this was certainly the case in Rotterdam's post-war reconstru reconstruction, where you know, functional segregation of the cities into different elements, one for entertainment, one for living, one for living, etc. Um, and the fetishization of automobiles effectively concealed a power move by the city's business class. Now, detractors of the city's current vision, the Wundvisi 2030 that I briefly talked about before, argue that the same thing is happening now. Gentrification, more money to developers, 
uh, in the guise of this new vision. Now, given the smart cities mobilization in general, the idea of the smart city, given its mobilization of similar arguments in favor of increased citizen monitoring and datification, I think we have ample reasons to worry about the coming technocracy. That was the slide. So, technocracy, writes Herbert Marcuse of the Frankfurt School, is a form of social organization in which the technical considerations of imperialistic efficiency and rationality supersede the traditional standards of profitability and general welfare. So, efficiency uh, trumps all, but the more important aspect of technocracy is that techno-scientific reasoning is used to mask political imperatives. So there's no point in launching resistance because science tells us so. So do we have reason to, to be concerned? Well, I truly believe so. And uh, my conclusion here is that if we're hoping that designerly visions of the future will plot this new path for urban development based on the small sample that I showed, I fear we will be disappointed. To some extent, even the designerly imagination is in crisis. It's not just something that the public is suffering for. And uh, from my experience teaching you know, design students, uh, I see this every day, trying to get them to think about the future uh, is not an easy task at all. But if we're going to wait for the public on their own right, to speak their mind and intervene, we might be equally disappointed. And uh, the low participation rates in the referendum that I mentioned before, I think, speak volumes. And Rotterdam is considered a very politically active city. This is a place where, where people are generally engaged. What we need, then, I suggest, is both to pluralize the future and to make futuring itself more inclusive. So to democratize the future, we need to democratize futuring. Thank you.